Okay, you're live. Madam Mayor, it's 6.03 and we're live. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this Tuesday, June 23rd, Special City Commission meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Mayor Pam Triolo. Here. Vice Mayor Andy Amoroso. Here. Commissioner Scott Maxwell. I see you. Commissioner Omari Hardy. Commissioner Herman Robinson. Here. If everyone would please rise for the pledge, led by the Vice Mayor. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, and to the Republic which stands, stands one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Okay, welcome everyone. We have got one item on the agenda today and we've got a lot of discussion ahead. I, we have item new business A, creating a task force to make recommendations to the city commission on the issue of eradicating systemic racism in the city of Lake Worth Beach. I'm sorry, Commissioner Robinson. Yes, uh, just to start things off, I, I make a motion to establish a task force with five committees to make a recommendation to the city commission on the issue of eradicating systemic racism in the city of Lake Worth Beach. I also propose to review and incorporate the input provided to us by the National League of Cities, the Race, Equity and Leadership an Initiative uh, tonight. Seconded. Okay, let's get started. Who would like to begin? Um, City Madam, Madam, yeah, Madam Mayor, um, at the last meeting when this was discussed, uh, there was a proposal put forward by Commissioner Robinson uh, to form a task force, which was discussed um, by the entire commission. Um, out of that meeting came a, a motion and direction to staff to look into uh, what uh, groups like the National League of Cities was doing. Um, on a national basis to, uh, to see if there was some ability to adopt the process or, or some things that have already been done in other uh, communities around the country. And um, had a very good conversation um, with the director of the race equality, I'm sorry, I just went off, went off uh, topic here. Um, race, race equity, equity and, and leadership, and leadership. I always forget the and is actually an A, it's real. And it's That's under the, the National League of Cities. Um, Leon Andrews, the director, is actually online tonight. Uh, he agreed to actually talk about and present um, the program. Um, and I didn't know if uh, Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor Pro Tem Maxwell, who had originally contacted Leon um, and had made the motion last time um, to bring up, bring this back to y'all, I wanted to insert any comments before Leon's um, discussion, but uh, he's ready to go with the presentation if y'all want to proceed that way. Commissioner Maxwell? Unmute. Unmute. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, as the city manager mentioned, I, I suggested at our last meeting that we reach out to organizations such as the National League of Cities or the U.S. Conference of Mayors to, to utilize what tools may be available to us going forward help facilitate any conversations that we uh, would like to have our community engage in with respect to uh, addressing the systemic race issues and uh, equity issues that uh, uh, affect uh, the black community, minority communities across, across America. Uh, as you know, I'm a very strong proponent of assuring that the residents of, uh, of Lake Worth Beach specifically be uh, the focal point of any conversation uh, that is begun here in the city with the idea that as these folks uh, get together and, and have that conversation, that there will come times when there will be certain takeaways, if you will, from the, the needs, their concerns or whatever, that we as a city can begin to address and, uh, and to uh, hopefully rectify. Uh, my expectation is that a conversation such as this is, is extremely important, one that probably has not taken place in any real form, uh, at least in my lifetime, and that uh, we should not really be imposing any type of, uh, self-imposing any type of time limits or time constraints, if you will, on any type of a conversation. You know, it's my anticipation that 
the potential for uh, our community leaders to come together and have these conversations could be going on in perpetuity. There's so much ground to cover, so many things to address that uh, it would be foolhardy for us to think that we can you know, kind of you know, do a sprint, if you will, and have an event and, and address them all in 90 days or six months. So with that being said, I've, I've spoken to Leon Andrews in the National League of Cities, and I'm really anxious and excited to hear uh, maybe his insight as to how they might be able to help us facilitate an effort such as I've just described. So with that, City Manager, did I leave out anything? No, Vice Mayor Pro Tem, I think you covered it well. Well, I, I think I'd like to welcome Leon. I, whoops, my screen just switched. Leon, are you there? Is he muted? Leon? I am. I am. Can you hear me? There you go. Okay. Well, Mr. Andrews, you like to welcome. Welcome, thank and you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and uh, good afternoon or good evening, commissioners. Um, glad to be with you and to share some of the work that we're doing here at, at the National League of Cities and with cities across the country. And hopefully some of the framing will be helpful for you as you're thinking about the, how the city is trying to center this in your work. Um, I have some time to really do some framing with you. So I'll do a little of that framing of how we got here, name it, and hopefully articulate how we could be helpful and what, how we are supporting other cities. Uh, I wanna start uh, bringing that into the room uh, by playing a short video that kind of names the moment. Why is a black life um, any, any more recoupable than a white life? Let it be known wherever we go that all of us should be free and equal and have all opportunities that others should have. I'm not the pig. You got to make a distinction. And the people are going to have to attack the pig. The people are going to have to stand up against the pig. So the only way we're going to get some of this oppression and exploitation away from us or aside from us is come together against the common enemy. with that uh, video because I felt in the last several weeks all of us have seen so many of these images across our country. We at the National League of Cities now see in over a thousand cities, towns, and villages, over a thousand city, towns, and villages, these protests, these uprisings that are happening and of all sizes. So the rising tension is, uh, and, uh, is playing out in all kinds of cities and we have been on this journey and I'll see for the last five years uh, when we launched Rio five years ago. Uh, I wanted to pull up this quote because I thought it was really uh, appropriate in the context of where we are today by the late Dr. Maya Angelou. Uh, her quote is, prejudice is a burden that confuses the past. It threatens the future and renders our present inaccessible. 
The reason why I thought that quote is so powerful in the moment is it acknowledges our inability to talk and be explicit about the injustices from prejudice to racism, not only, imp not only confuses how we understand our past, it, it impacts our present and our future. In fact, we will find ourselves coming back to these conversations five, 10, 50 years from now. And so the work is really, uh, that, that's really the work in front of cities. How are we not, you know, I wanna acknowledge five years ago, this is, you know, the, these images we've seen five years ago where people were out. Uh, Ferguson was a reality five years ago for, the, for those that remember all the images we were seeing. And many cities were saying five years ago when Real was created, help us not become a Ferguson. So it's really the, the conversation was help us to prevent, prevent further conflict from that happening in our cities. Now what we're seeing in, in the, the responses is not prevent us from becoming a Ferguson. There are demands on pressures on city leaders to really understand what's at the root of addressing some of the systemic and institutional inequities that, are, that people are asking for from city leaders. And that raises lots of questions about what's the role of city leaders in that space. And so Real was created five years ago with that charge in mind. How do we help you as city leaders strengthen your knowledge and your capacity to understand your role in eliminating racial disparities, healing racial tensions and divisions, and building more equitable communities? And so we've been on that journey in the last five years, creating multiple places of supporting city leaders. We provide training and capacity building, technical assistance, network building, connecting with other your peers across the country, and also uh, building out special populations, realizing that this work is so much connected to uh, how we understand impacts on boys and, boys and men of color, women and girls, LGBTQ, our indigenous, our indigenous population, our religiously persecuted population. There's a lot of those special populations where the intersections are very clear and present in the work that we do in cities and how that is showing up in the work. Uh, and so our work wanted to, to give you a sense of, we've been literally all over the country in the last five years. We have been in over now 400 cities, towns, and villages. Uh, you can see the presence we have had in Florida, uh, but we've also literally been in cities across this country um, through trainings and technical assistance, capacity building, and just building out the network. Um, and so what we have learned in the five years uh, is that there is no one size fits all to this work. There is no plug and play. There isn't, this is how you do it. Just check these six boxes and you're good as a city. But there is a good framework. And I wanted to bring that into the, into the space this evening as you think about the work that's in front of you. This three components is really critical to what we have found any effective strategy that a city is committed to advancing. What's the space you're doing to normalize a conversation in your city on racial equity? What's that work that needs to happen at the council level, within the city, within the community? Uh, what are you doing to or operationalize it? What tools are you using and data that, that's grounding how you center racial equity and how are you organizing it? And because this is not a training, I'm not gonna go into depth into all of these. I introduce it because it's a helpful framework. I'll share some of the context, hopefully that gives you a helpful way of understanding the work we do. Uh, and so the way I wanted to present it is how we serve the community, how we serve cities around these four areas. Um, and so as you think about how NLC can support you, uh, we can support you through a range of assessments. As you think about the normalizing, operationalizing, organizing, through trainings, uh, through community conversations that need to play out, and also through strategic plans, developing a racial equity plan. Uh, so I want to hit on those four to kind of give you a sense of each of those. I'll spend a little bit more time um, on the training aspect. On the assessment level, I want you to kind of just know we do assessments at different levels with cities. Uh, we provide assessment at a staffing level. You know, the assessment is so important, both in terms of understanding where people are, where their starting point is, and how they are centering and understanding racial equity, where that is playing out at your department or institutional level, how that is playing out in the data that you're collecting, data not just quantitatively, but your qualitative data from hearing the voices from your Black, Indigenous, and people of color, uh, which is now affectionately known as BIPOC. Um, and so how are you centering their voices in this work? And also, how are you also bringing 
those voices within the community that are doing the work and that, that whole stakeholder level of assessment. I can definitely talk more in depth about what each of the assessments are, but for sake of time, I'm not going to go into depth about how we go through our process, but wanted to at least give you a sense of that's one aspect of ways that we work with cities um, in supporting your efforts to center racial equity. Uh, the second is around racial equity training. Uh, we offer a, a training series and even more so now in our virtual context as everyone has been quarantined. Um, creating spaces to train around each of those areas, training around the normalizing, which is our real 100 series, Trace, training around the uh, operationalizing, which is our 200 series, around organizing, uh, which is our 300 series. And we also um, have a train to trainer series, which is our 400 series. How do we empower city leaders, city staff, and the community to really have, be equipped to be able to do this work beyond kind of the moment as I think uh, Commissioner Maxwell acknowledged, this is a journey that you're on. It's not a short-term journey, but it's very a sustained journey that you're on. So I can definitely talk about each of the components, but I just wanted you to know that there's a series of trainings that we offer cities and the work that we do. Um, and as we do this work, the other aspect of our work is so critical that we've learned in the five years is the kind of learning environment that you're setting for yourself as, count, as commissioners, but also in, in, in the spaces with your with city staff and with the community. We have a learning environment that, that we think is really critical. These six components are kind of the start of that learning environment, acknowledging that everyone needs a safe space to have this conversation. You need to have some level of accountability. You need to have kind of a space where people recognize that when it gets uncomfortable, they need to lean into the uncomfortable but also recognizing the spaces you create, there's no assumption that everyone understands the same thing and starting from the same point. Um, and so what's the work that needs to be done where everyone starts from where they are? Um, and so, that, so these components are really reinforced in our training, reinforced in the spaces that we facilitate um, with, with city leaders and with the community. So that learning environment is at the core of our training and the work that we do. Um, and so what I'd like to be able to offer uh, it's to give you a sense of this, um, you know, because as you're having a conversation, really is important that we are, uh, I, I hope I, one of the things I can do is leave a space where we're doing some of that normalizing as a, as a commission. Um, and so wanted to be able to acknowledge some key terminology in this space. Um, you know, and again, doing this work for five years, starting from where you are, um, knowing even now today in the work we do, people still use the words equity and equality interchangeably, and they are not the same words, right? If there's one thing you learn for, if you hear, if there's one thing you learned from me today, if you didn't know that already, is that these are th two very different words. Um, the first here, uh, trying to explain in a very simple way is equality is, uh, is, this, is this diagram, three people trying to watch the game from behind the fence and you give them all the same thing. The goal is to, it's the goal for them to watch the game from behind the fence. That's equality, giving them all the same thing if the goal is for them to watch the game from behind the fence. Equity is a question of what do people need? Uh, it is asking that question. What do people need if the goal is to watch the game from behind the fence? The guy on the left doesn't need anything to watch anything, watch the game from behind the fence. The person in the middle needs two boxes to watch the game comfortably, and the person on the right needs a ramp to be able to watch the, uh, watch the game comfortably behind the fence. So if there's one clear, that's really critical in a one-on-one, -on -one, right? Just knowing that I do not use equality and equity, they're two separate different words. And hopefully the image in a simple way helps you kind of just keep that very clear in your mind. But it's also really important to know that as you go deeper in, e in equity, it's much more complicated than just the, than this diagram. There are a range of questions that you can ask yourself. There are questions about, is there something wrong with the fence? Is there something wrong with the ground that they're standing on? Do we actually have the right goal? Should they be behind the fence? Should they be in the stands? Should they be playing in the game? Should they be owning the team, right? There's all kinds of questions you could be asking yourself if you really are committed to centering equity and figuring out what is the right goal that we're trying to shoot for. And that's the process you need to go through to make sure you're setting the right desired results as you really are centering equity. And you can't assume that you know what those results are, even as leaders in your community, like what's the work to be clear about what it takes to be able to center equity. Um, and so that was one space that I wanted to just name in that normalizing that I hope is helpful. The second is why we lead with race. When NLC uh, launched Real five years ago, 
we were very intentional about putting a comma between race and equity. It was race, comma, equity, and leadership. So we were acknowledging the importance of race. We also were acknowledging the importance as an organization to really address issues of equity. And so our all, all equity issues. And so when we launched our first Real Talk you know, five years ago, we had about 500 elected officials in our conference in DC in March. And it was a mess. The conversation, everybody felt passionately about some issue of equity, whether, whatever we were talking about. And so everyone was talking about everything and nothing all at the same time. And so I really named that because as you're on the journey, it's really important to be clear about what you're talking about as you're engaging with each other in this space. And the reason why we led with race, it was the data was very clear. When we looked at the data, whether it was infant mortality to life expectancy, race is still the strongest predictor of one's success in this country. And so whether we're talking about education or we're talking about the criminal justice system or talking about health or economic development, holding everything constant, race is still the strongest predictor. So it doesn't mean that we don't want to talk about poverty or that we shouldn't talk about gender equity or we shouldn't talk about housing. It's like you can't talk about those issues without also centering equity in the conversations because of what we know from the data. And how do you then do the work to understand what it means to center that in the conversation? And so I know I know, I said a lot by naming that. I wanna give a data example of a study that was done by the Center for Disease Control. Uh, this was looking at the maternal mortality rates of women across the country. This was done two, a couple of years ago. And they controlled for everything else in a woman's background. They controlled for how much money she made, what her, uh, what, her, uh, what her education was, where she lived, or, uh, et cetera. And after controlling for that, they found that black women were still two to three times higher to have uh, maternal, maternal mortality rates, right? And so you look at the data, if the data leads you there, then it's the question of why is that, right? That's the work that is you really are trying to center racial equity. How do you get to place of centering it? And to know that we're not just talking about maternal mortality rates. We're talking about the, 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 our education system. We're talking about our unemployment. We're talking about housing. We're talking about our justice and, and, and law enforcement and criminal justice system. And it's also really important to name here, we're not just talking about black and white. It's really understanding the differences between our Latinx community and our uh, API, sub-API populations and our indigenous uh, community, right? And so doing that data work is so critical to you normalizing and centering that work in what you do. And so the reason why I bring up that data is because then you, we throw out the term racial equity. And so then what do we mean when we say racial equity? If we know that the data shows that race is still the strongest predictor of one's success, racial equity is closing the gaps. So race does not predict one's success while improving outcomes for everyone. So we don't wanna see race being the strongest predictor. And we, wanna, we also wanna see outcomes improve for everybody. And so what's the work that we need to do to target? What do we need to do to really go beyond services and really look at root causes that are addressing systemic inequities? And so wanted to name that um, in that space. And again, acknowledging as I do that, that this is not uh, a training, right? It's just intended to really give you some normalizing language as you have your conversations and continue to figure out how you move forward. And the other piece of this that I think is important to name you know, I think it's, if you think it's hard to talk about equity, hard to talk about equality, hard to talk about racial equity, just talking about, also talking about racism is even hard because what tends to happen um, is people tend to think about racism at the individual level. And the work that we do at the National League of Cities is very much targeted to working with city leaders, not just to understand racism at the individual level, but institutionally and structurally. Re acknowledging that their policies, practices, procedures that have benefited white people over people of color, sometimes intentionally, many times unintentionally and in, in a, in a, in a, inadvertently. Um, and it didn't just happen within one institution. It has happened in multiple institutions. And so when we talk about institutional racism, that language, if you hear people using it, is usually referring to one institution, like that's happening within the police system. But structural uh, racism is acknowledging that it's not just in the police system. It's in our education system. It's in our housing. It's in, it's in multiple institutions, which is what structural racism tends to refer to. Um, and so I know I named a whole lot in that space, and I know this is not a training. And so what I 
what I don't want to do is leave you with that without bringing that into the room for you for that to really be named. And so there's this video called The House We Live In. Um, it's I'm not, I obviously don't have the time to play the whole video, but I want to play a clip of it that brings in what I try to say with my words that I think does very powerfully in a video. time when hundreds of thousands of GIs came home ready to start families, but had no place to live. In the 1930s, the federal government created the Federal Housing Administration, whose job it was to uh, provide loans or the backing for loans to average Americans so they could purchase a home. Federal programs and banks sank millions into the home construction industry. Their message to veterans, you can afford a new home. Buy a new home now. Tax dollars help make the single family home a mass produced consumer item. The American dream had a new name. Suburbia. to Levittown and we found the model house and we walked in and we looked around and uh, of course in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto so to speak it was an interesting experience interesting lifestyle seeing all the new modern conveniences very fascinating Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized a national appraisal system where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk. So that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanize in America, and it suburbanized it racially. As homes in white communities appreciated in value, the net worth of these white families grew. For most non-white families who stayed in urban neighborhoods, the housing market open to them in the 50s and 60s was largely a rental market. You don't gain equity by paying rent. Where one's family lives in America is not just a matter of, of taste and preference. You have the issue of housing and wealth. The 
the majority of Americans hold most of their wealth in the form of home equity. So that's their nest egg. That's how they can finance the education of their offspring. That's how they can um, sort of save up for retirement. Um, it's their savings bank, right? They're living in their savings bank. My family, like a lot of families, was in Detroit struggling to buy a house. You had a dual housing market, one white, one black. A housing market with one with a lot of demand, another housing market with very little demand. My father lives in the house that I grew up in. The house today, five bedroom house, is worth about $20,000. The same house bought in the suburbs would be worth today about $320,000. So whites moving to the suburb were being subsidized in the accumulation of wealth, while blacks were being divested. And these were public policy decisions in which on one hand, people were given access to property, um, given title, and subsequently wealth, and on another hand, where people were not given access to property, did not generate wealth, and did not generate the kind of opportunity for the next generation. So I know I, what I hope I did in that, again, I knowing that this is not a training, but you, when you're in a virtual setting, you want to be mindful of, you throw out terminology, you want people to be able to sit with what you mean, and so it might be just saying the definitions, institutional racism, that there were policies, practices, procedures that benefited white people over communities of color. That can be hard to sit with depending on where your starting point is. I hope what the video did in, you know, in that five minute clip, it just named redlining as an example of just one of those policies and understanding that there is a history. Many people have heard the term redlining. A lot of our elected officials have heard the term redlining. Um, but when you, but even in that short video, even people that have heard of it learn something new, learn that government played a role, learn that there was larger implications of how it impacted people as we think about wealth generation in this country, right? So there's a lot to sit with in that space and wanted to, while I can't do a whole bunch of normalizing with the time I have, I hope I named some of that, right? For you as you as a council and commission are really trying to figure out understanding why, why change is needed as you're trying to center racial equity but also don't want to leave you with just talking about normalizing, right? I think it's important to know that while you may start to see the problem and are starting to think about what more you can do is in how then do you operationalize? And so that's part of our work that we do too. How do we introduce tools that help you think about how do you center racial equity in your work? And so this is an example of a tool where in our tool, as we work with city leaders, the work is how do you center the voices of the community in doing that work? That's right there in the center. I think you heard that uh, um, um, in some of the proposals that you put out with the task force that you want to create or hearing on the journey that you guys are talking about that you want to hear the voices of those in the community, the black indigenous people of color. So I think as a commission, you, you guys already see the value of centering the voices as you are looking at the kinds of results and the data understanding who's been benefited and burdened by your strategies. And so. We acknowledge the, we do a lot of work in, in working with cities to operationalize it. And as you center your racial equity tool, looking at a range of policies that connect to your decision-making. How do you look at your fines and fees structure? How do you look at your contracting policies? How do you look at some of your policing and bail or public and recreational spaces? There's a lot of things you can do as you start to center racial equity and looking at some of those policies uh, practices and, and, and procedures that are in place that have, could have negative impacts on, you know, particularly your uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, right? So I wanted to name that as we talk about the um, operationalizing and also recognize um, some of the spaces that we also work with you, uh, work with cities, is how do you do your stakeholder engagement assessment, right? Which is who are you engaging? Who needs to be at the table? How are you being very intentional about um, thinking about those networks um, as you're doing the work as city leaders to begin engaging the community. So the stakeholder assessment is kind of that other component that we talk about. Um, and then I think the other, the other deliverable that I mentioned earlier are the uh, community conversation. So while we talk about the normalizing work that needs to happen, there is a kind of a balance in the work we do with cities that not, not only is there acknowledgement that we as city leaders need to do the work, we need to be thinking about policy, but 
what are we doing to create these real talk conversations with the with their community? What's the space that you're creating? And we offer a range of supports to help you if we could be helpful there as you think about speakers, as you think about how to partner with those to have these conversations, how to think about what the conversation looks like. Uh, we have a few of them on our website and want to encourage you to check out the, the full kind of com real talk conversations we've had with communities that we think could be helpful. Um, want to play this snip bit. If you really want to talk about a real talk conversation, this was um, one of our first real talks that we had um, that really talks about what a real talk sounds like, right? If you're really committed to having a real talk. So I want to play the short clip. Tim, you have uh, written a book about this subject from a different perspective. Um, what, did you, what, what are your thoughts, uh, opening thoughts, about where we are in America right now? Well, uh, you know, in the three minutes, you know, three to five that we've been given, I'll do my best to, to answer it. And, and I know we're going to get deeper into this conversation as we go. So I'll save some of, of what I want to talk about for that. But um, I really appreciate the way that you framed the discussion at the outset, because at least on two occasions, I heard you reference something that we really don't do very much in this country, and that is you reference systemic racism, and you referred to it in that way. And I think that's important. In fact, it's critical, not just for the National League of Cities effort, but for our conversation as a country, because too often what we do, and I think we all know this, is we look at racism as that thing that happened in Charleston. That is to say, and when I say that thing that happened, I'm not talking about the generations of institutional racism. I'm talking about the thing that happened this summer. We look at that as racism. We say, well, Dylan Roof walks into a church and massacres nine people and the city comes together and the state comes together and the country grieves um, and that's racism. And so, and then we sort of wash our hands of it because we say, well, thankfully that doesn't happen every week. That doesn't happen all the time. That's an anomaly. But we have to be prepared to look at racism as something that's far deeper than that and not about bigotry, not about overt hatred and not just about that type of random retail violence, because that's retail violence. we got wholesale violence. And by that, I mean, if you're going to understand what happened in Baltimore in the last six months, you cannot start with Freddie Gray and you cannot start even with the police department in Baltimore. You have to start with the fact that that is a community that was wrecked by so-called urban renewal. That was violence when they come in and they put the interstate through your community and they knock down your business and they knock down your apartments and they make folks huddle into small crowded housing and they essentially lock them in a holding pen. I mean, we, we, we talk about housing and education. We talk about neighborhoods as if it's not about racism. We, we act like folks just ended up where they ended up. But let's be clear, this thing that we in this country call the ghetto, that was created. And it wasn't created by black people. And it wasn't created by poor people. It was created by folks who were usually not black and definitely not poor as a holding pen for the people they didn't want to live amongst them. So we have to be prepared to call that violence. If you don't call zoning laws and redlining violence, even though it does violence, and you don't call it racism, then how are we going to solve that? So I want us to frame this conversation the way that you've done it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we are as a country. We're still stuck in this mode of describing racism as this interpersonal thing rather than understanding it structurally and institutionally. And I think until we get to that place where we can talk about not just that individual cop who does something wrong in the community, which we can see plenty of examples of that, but until we deal with the mentality that says that spatial isolation, segregation, residential isolation, um, black and brown kids going to schools 12 times more likely to be places of concentrated poverty, that's not an accident. People didn't choose that. And so I, I, I think that's where we need to go, is to, is to frame the conversation in a way that reminds us that we're talking about systemic and structural violence. And we can't just talk about um, the sort of retail level stuff, as important as that is, and as horrific as a hate crime is. Um, you know, to be really honest, at the risk of being hyperbolic, aspects of this country's history have been an intergenerational hate crime against certain people. And that's just the truth. We don't like to use language like that. Um, you know, sounds un-American, unpatriotic, whatever kind of terminology we use, but that's real. And unless we're prepared to do it that way and have that conversation that way, I'm afraid we'll keep spinning our wheels, coming back, having the same conversations over and over and over again. The reason that low-income black folks were the ones hit hardest in New Orleans was not an accident. And what was stunning to me about it, and I lived there for 10 years, the only people that were shocked by what happened, for the most part, were white folks. Black folks weren't shocked that they got uprooted. They weren't shocked that they got left behind and forgotten. That was the history of that community. 
right? Urban Renewal did that. Interstate highway construction right through the Treme, the oldest free black neighborhood in this country, did that. And so it was just same thing, different day. A little bit more extreme and the cameras were on and, you know, they made movies about it. But it was the same stuff that had always been happening. So we have to go back to that systemic understanding, which is something I think the movement historically knew, but most of our leaders have sometimes forgotten. Wow. Uh, so we're going to have a real conversation today, aren't we? <laughs> I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready. <laughs> so that was a, a sample of a real talk with Tim Wise, who's on our real board of advisors, who shared the opening kind of start to that talk, said a lot in three and a half minutes. Um, there, and some people, as they sit with that, it's like, well, there's a lot to unpack in that space, right? There's a lot to understand, particularly as we think about city leadership and what the role of local government is. And so I name, brought that in because how are you creating spaces for those real talks, right, within your city? I know as I was speaking with Michael, there's a rich history uh, within, this, uh, within the city of Lake, uh, Lake Worth uh, Beach uh, that needs, you need to have a real talk about that history, right? What's the space that you're creating to sit with that, to understand that? How do you lean into spaces when it's uncomfortable as folks are bringing that voice into that space? And so I wanted to acknowledge that space because in all of the other, uh, while there's work you need to do as city leaders, there's also those conversations that need to happen. And you have to be ready and equipped to be able to have those conversations as city leaders in that space. Um, and then finally, the, the, the last piece I mentioned to that, to, to the components, three components is organizing. Um, and so how to get started, right? So I gave you a list of how NLC could help from the assessments to the training, uh, to the helping you with the community conversations, helping you develop a racial equity plan. But there, we also have a guide that we encourage you to download or if, if you haven't already, this how you could get started on your own as a city. What, and there's some examples of how cities have gotten started about what you can do. There are simple things you could do about how you set the example, spaces you're creating to listen, public declarations that you're making, you know, dedicated infrastructure that you feel need to be in place to show your commitment. Um, your work that you're doing to really get at root causes as you look at those systems and policy failures and kind of using a tool that gets you to the root causes of why those policies are in place or your commitment to developing a racial equity plan. So I laid out these six uh, we have the guide that we encourage you to, you know, that's, you can take that at any time, look at some of those examples, think about uh, are any of those applicable as you think about your own work, about how you want to get started in, in your city. Um, and there's also profiles. We've done a range of city profiles of what cities have done across this country to center racial equity of different sizes from St. Louis Park or the village of uh, Park Forest in Illinois. To, uh, to Boston, right? So this is a range of city examples of what it looks like, different sizes um, um, across this kind of, and, and, and different regions across the country. So we wanna encourage you to also take full advantage of those resources. They're available to you as you're learning. And we're also happy to connect you to that network of your, of your peers in that space. Uh, and, but also know that we're learning a lot from those examples. Like there, while there's not a one size fits all, there is some common themes about you know, what core team are you creating within your city that's committed to this? Um, how are you thinking about interdepartmental work that needs to happen across the different agencies or your departments? What kind of agreements or plans are you putting in place or performance reviews or, you know, um, or how are you using racial equity tools? So there are some good frameworks as you're thinking about organizing that you know, we definitely can work with you and share with you those uh, those models as we're um, and we and I should also acknowledge on our website there is a repository of policies that if you wanted to see what other cities are doing and policies that they put in place that's also a place you can go to to kind of get a sample of what some of those policies are in different areas how they how they center it in their budgets how they center it in um, in some of their other policy areas so I want to encourage you in that space. Um, and then in our work, if we, you know, this is kind of an example of our work with cities. I know I named a lot of different things around assessments and trainings and community conversations and strategic planning. Just want to acknowledge all this stuff, it doesn't happen all at the same time, right? So it's like, how do you sequence it, right? How do you think about the sequencing of it from the assessment work that needs to happen to the trainings that need to happen to the community conversations? It's really important, again, in this not one size fits all to build out a timeline. And this is what we do with cities and really thinking through how to sequence it, how to do it in partnership with 
with your community. So I just wanted to name that because I know I named a whole lot in, in how we could be serving and knowing that that's another process that we're working very thoughtfully with you and um, as you're working through your efforts. Um, and then finally, I think hopefully what is grounded in what I presented to you is how we think really at the end of the day change happens. These three components, we think as cities, if you're committed to centering racial equity, this, it's got to start with you understanding why change is needed as a commission. You have to see why change is needed. Um, and then you also will need to begin to see potential solutions that you can take to make those changes. And there's got to be a collective sense of urgency. Um, so we're not finding ourselves coming back here a year, five years, or 10 years from now. Uh, and we believe in the work we do with cities when it's really working at optimal level, all three are happening in the, in, on the ground and in cities. So I want to end with a quote um, from Angela Davis. Uh, hopefully uh, it leaves you in a space of wanting to do more, not wanting to do less. So it's acknowledging I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And we hope that is kind of a space you're in as you're having these conversations of how you want to center this work. So I appreciate you guys allowing us to have a chance to, for me to share the work that we're doing. And I'm happy to, if there's time allotted, to take any questions or react to any of the discussions that you have. Thank you so much. Commissioner Maxwell? Yes, ma'am. Do, do you have anything you wanted to ask? Well, no, I just wanted to thank Leon uh, profusely because as I said, let me take this off try this. As I've been trying in my own way, from my own perspective, been trying to uh, share with the commission is that that uh, what we're embarking upon, that this, this agenda item, this, this uh, initiative, if you will, is bigger than all of us. And there's just so much that we have to, to factor in. And uh, it's not simply a matter of, um, you know, identifying a few items that we think are uh, obvious issues that that have uh, not been uh, equitable in the past and to maybe you know prescribe some solutions to those issues when we we really need to start with the community and ask them uh, to begin a conversation those conversations very well may lead us to one or more of those five items but i think it's important for us to make sure that we we include them we embrace them we create that space that they can feel comfortable with and, and, and let them lead us for once. As I said at the last meeting, elected officials and politicians, if there was ever a time where we need to keep our mouths shut and listen, this is the time. And the only way we're gonna do that is to, to, to embrace the people who are directly impacted, who've been affected by this, these issues over the history of our country. And, um, and I want to thank Leon so much for kind of pointing out uh, some of the tools that are available to us and some of the framework that's going to be necessary to help us with that, that conversation and that journey. Thank you very much, Commissioner Maxwell. And thank you very much, Mr. Andrews. That was an incredible presentation. And uh, I've kind of been thinking along those lines, too. What's out there? What exists that we can follow some sort of not just the policies and procedures, but the types of conversations, the meaningful conversations that we need to have and create a plan. So um, very excited about this, guys. I see some hands, hold on. Commissioner Hardy, you have your hand up? Yes, I had my hand up, thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Andrews, for uh, joining us. Uh, what I'll say before I say anything else with respect to the presentation um, and before we go to discussion on the um, um, framework that was brought forward by Commissioner Robinson. Uh, watching that presentation that Mr. Andrews gave here um, on our virtual dais, so to speak, um, made me feel sane. Um, many of those issues uh, I've discussed here, there was, a, there was a healthy conversation throughout that presentation about zoning, for example, and about the racial impact of zoning. And not a year ago, I brought forward a zoning change that was devoted primarily to allowing 
people who cannot buy a home for whatever reason to be able to live in neighborhoods where predominantly only single family homes exist. And I felt, if I'm to exercise these feelings now, that the issues that I brought forward as reasons to allow something as simple as an accessory dwelling unit or a granny cottage or a backyard home or whatever to be legal in single family homes, I felt that rationale was dismissed completely, right? That we could not possibly challenge the sanctity of this thing that we all grew up with, even if there were reasons dealing with racial equity, dealing with class equity, and so on and so forth that were relevant and stated. That's, that's what I felt, right? That we had some things we were clinging to in the, and, and that because of that, we couldn't rationalize our way around some of these policies. And so we have someone who's here, who's giving us a presentation on racial equity, who said a lot of the things I say about the racial impact of zoning, right? And I'm glad that we gave a space and a time for this conversation to be had and a space and a time for us to potentially change our, our minds. And I'm hopeful that on a range of issues, we discussed community IDs, which would have, which would have benefited the undocumented population. That was a hot button issue here. That was a racial equity issue also. That was a policing issue also, right? I, I hope now that we're willing to have this conversation, and conversations are fun, but I hope that we're willing to follow through on some of these things and to and, and which which will require us to get extremely uncomfortable. I appreciate the fact that Commissioner Maxwell asked the League of Cities and this initiative to get involved because I think it is very important for us to learn from what other people have done in this area. I, I don't think we should recreate the wheel in every respect. And I do think that there's uh, that there are many things about this that have to be, for lack of a better word, professionalized. Um, and I think the League of Cities has created a great resource on this. And I look forward to involving the League of Cities in our effort and, and, and leaning on them as a resource as we try to address this issue. Very specifically, some things were said though, that I feel are cover for other things, okay? There was, a, there was talk about how we can't put certain things on a timeline. I agree that a lot of this conversation needs to be had every day in perpetuity. Some of these conversations, however, need to be had and then punctuated. And I feel, and Commissioner Robinson mentioned this in the last meeting, um, that there is a potential to use process to draw out an uncomfortable conversation past the point by which we could have acted. And so I, I, I can't let go the idea that some things need to be done quickly. There are some issues around police reform, frankly, some things that I think we need to do, asking formally the sheriff to use body cameras here in this city this issue has been discussed, studied ad nauseum outside this county and in this county, in our own county's criminal justice system. Things like that, that's not a perpetual conversation. Um, and if it is, there are sentences in that conversation that can be written, punctuated, and published, and we can give you part two at a later date. So I look forward to having a conversation about these task force, or excuse me, these task forces or a task force with several committees. 
I'm, you know, I'm, I'm challenged in my speech right now, but I, 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 I just hope that we want to get things done and not just have a conversation that's going to lead to some warm and fuzzies, but that won't lead to the policy changes that have been discussed before in this building that we know affect in a positive way um, the problems that we're trying to solve. So before we get into our deliberations about task forces and form and composition and time and jobs and all this stuff, I'm thankful that Commissioner Robinson brought this gentleman here and I, I look forward to continuing to work with the League of Cities on this topic. Commissioner Maxwell, yeah. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Leon, for really uh, bringing this uh, and thanks uh, to the city manager and everybody that uh, made this happen. Uh, I, you uh, have seen the five uh, committees that I proposed. You're, I have. And I'd like your uh, assessment of those. I don't, I don't have an, an assessment. I, I, uh, I don't have context, but I thought, you um, know, you know, I think the, the first uh, area that I always pay attention to, and I don't know the city of Lake uh, Worth Beach is what, what do you have direct oversight over? Um, oh. And as, as you think about, um, and then as I, as I think about, cause part of, as I think about the work we do with cities and I appreciate Commissioner Hardy's remarks you want to make sure that what you're not communicating to the city, uh, to your residents, is that we want to have these committees. You make recommendations. The recommendations come forth, and then the city can't act on them because it's not under your purview, right? So you you want to think very thoughtfully. And I don't know again the full structure, but I do think you want to be thinking about committee structures oh, that impact. Uh, could could you just go down the list uh, of the committees that are proposed and and uh, address those individually. I can let me I, I would, let me give me a moment to pull it up. And what I was proposing was that each commissioner would take take a committee and reach out to the community. I know that we can talk this thing to death for a long time. Uh, listening is good. Uh, the community needs to listen to its leaders as well. So yep. uh, that's called communication. Um, listening's a two-way street uh, in, in my estimation now. And so uh, the, the committees I'm looking at, Commissioner, is this the police, education, housing, health and human services, and financial security? Yes. Yep. So again, I, I'm, I know for the most part, education, uh, police, does the city have direct authority over the police? We have a contract with the, the county sheriff. And uh, some are, like Commissioner Hardy mentioned, it are, are going to be more um, um, evident to make changes. Others are going to be um, longer and more difficult. Uh, uh, are you thinking that uh, the, the committee, for, just for efficiency's sake, uh, we can break out these five committees and and uh, and uh, come back with uh, some input, so possible solutions. Again, I, I want to acknowledge I'm stepping into a conversation without context, right? And and again, I think um, my I, I, but I have done work. Again, the advice I give cities typically is um, I I don't want to set the city up for failure particularly if a city is, is committed to centering racial equity and wants to show that you're not just having conversations to heal, but you're committed to structural changes. And so both need to happen. You want to have the healing space because you have to acknowledge the, you know, the history of, our, of racism, but you also want to say we're committed as a city to structural changes. And I just don't know, looking at these committees, I know education is not a space that cities control a lot over. Um, and, and so I know if you got educational recommendations back, I'm not sure if you've done the work to get the, is the, is the school district at the table? Are they also committing to this, to the partnership? Right. There are questions I would want to make sure you're going through 
or you're communicating, if you'd have the committees that you're communicating to the community that there are some recommendations that come back that we don't have oversight over. Um, so they oh. don't feel that they're expecting you to do something that you don't have the power to, to, do, to do. But I expect the education, uh, Board of Education to be at the table uh, for an education committee. Uh, these are agencies and, and uh, institutions that uh, I certainly expect to be included in all these, these uh, committees. Um, so, uh, and you, you know, I've heard uh, urgency uh, several times in your presentation and in the, the booklet here. Um, I, uh, you know, we've, we've, we haven't talked about this a lot, but it's been proposed three weeks ago. And uh, I'm certainly expecting uh, trust in, in my fellow commissioners uh, because the community is trusting in us to, uh, to move forward with this. And uh, I would expect that uh, at the end of the evening, we'll have a trust uh, uh, a committee to, uh, that is tasked with more than just talk. Um, and it's important that we listen, it's important that we talk, but uh, I, I know that we can uh, come up with things that can make a difference in, in these five topics. Um, I thank you again. You're welcome. Thank You're you, welcome. Robinson. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Leon, I just want to thank you for being here tonight. I've had the chance to work with you uh, with the National League of Cities over the last five years. I think I attended most of all your, your group meetings and, and you do great work. And that's why I'm very happy that you were here tonight. And I know there's a lot of other groups out there that can you know bring something to the table. This is a, an awful big piece of luggage to unpack. And um, I look forward to working with you in the future and any other organizations that you can bring to the table that might help us, you know, get to where we need to be. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's funny because it seems that um, the vice mayor and vice mayor pro tem are going sort of in the same direction, especially uh, Commissioner Maxwell. Um, I actually reached out, I was trying to think of you know, who has the experience in it. And I know you guys are extremely active in League of Cities. So I'm, I'm so glad you brought Mr. Andrews here. Um, I was looking to, I was looking locally and reached out to county commissioners um, and also to our county uh, mayor. And um, I spoke with Rosalind Murray, who was a senior analyst for the Palm Beach County Criminal Justice Commission, the CJC. And they also have a, uh, a board and outreach committees and training programs and things of that nature. And I was just going to bring that up, um, you know, that they have something existing in place or whatever. And I'm sure you probably overlap similar, it's probably same things that you're doing too for the League of Cities. Um, I also wanted to bring back to the Racial Equity Institute. I know uh, Commissioner Hardy, you had mentioned that before that you attended there. And I that, ask staff to attend as well. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a mandatory training we should all do as soon as possible. And I would say that, you know, if we could immediately turn our travel budgets, since none of us are traveling now with what's been going on, if we can turn our travel budget over to pay for the training for all of us and staff, some staff members too, and maybe even members of the community in key areas or something, that would be um, a great recommendation that we could start immediately with. Um, I'd be really happy to do that. I also, like I said, if it's not if it's not the League of Cities, um, if it's not real, or if it's the CJC, or whatever it is, I know that um, if if it was a CJC type of thing, I know that Mayor Kerner, who sits on that board, would want to be a part of our board. He he said to please let everyone know that um, he's ready to step up. In fact, he's been urging the County Commission to look at something like that um, as well. So I think that we're we're in a good place. I think we're all on a, on a similar in a similar direction of, of where we need to go. It's how do we what's how do we take the next steps? I, I know that Commissioner Hardy wants to go, and I know Commissioner Robinson want you know this like ninety day turnaround. Well, and I, no, 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 I don't. No. no. Oh, okay. Call in a second, Commissioner Hardy. Sure. There are some, as I said last meeting and this meeting, there are some things that we need to 
uh, address, um, uh, well, frankly, there are some things that can be addressed more quickly than others. So, right. so, so things that do not require a lifetime of, of study and engagement on, uh, we should identify a timeline by which a task force or a committee on a task force can study this issue and come back to the commission for recommendations and, and, and action on those, on those things. Um, and so for, for example, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but we were talking about police reform. There have been many, many organizations across the United States, uh, ranging from community organizations all the way up to President Obama's task force, force on 21st century policing that have chewed that stake uh, until it has, you know, lost all the sinew. And, and, and you know, th th there is report after report after report, document after document about best practices and things that, that we can do. I don't see a need for a task force or a committee on a task force that is focused on policing to, um, uh, uh, you know, spend a year studying that issue before even coming back to the commission for any recommendations. There are perhaps some issues that need to be studied for longer than 90 days, but there are some issues, for example, like whether we want to request PBSO to use body cameras that, man, our own criminal justice commission here studied that issue at nauseum. They produced at least, I'm gonna, you know, I, I downloaded you know, a lot of those documents and, and, and read them. I'm gonna say at least three to 4,000 pages of documents on that particular topic and best practices for implementation and whatnot. I don't think that's something that should take a year to come back from a task force to recommend, hey, we need to ask PBSO to use body cameras, right? And, and, and see exactly where they are on this and get an answer from them on paper and well, to create a roadmap for how to use them. Here's the so question that's I just, have. Yeah. Question I have is like, okay, I spoke, I had the meeting with the mayors and with Sheriff Bradshaw, mm -hmm. right? And Sheriff Bradshaw says he's not adverse to putting for body cameras. Mm -hmm. He's he said that he was more than happy to do it. It's the funding because remember, mm -hmm. the county sheriff answers to the county commission, and they're looking to the county commission to provide the funding for it. Okay, and so, uh, so uh, yeah, let me be as respectful as as possible. Uh, the sheriff has informed us that he has changed his mind on this issue. And when I got elected, the sheriff was a no on body cameras. It was a flat no. And at that time, at that time, you know, we're at the tail end of the Obama administration. I got elected in March of 2016. There were hundreds of millions of dollars available in grant money for local law enforcement agencies to buy body worn cameras. As a matter of fact, before he had even left office and all that money had been spent, the Obama administration bought 50,000 body cameras for law enforcement agencies around the country. One law enforcement agency, as you, as you noted, uh, LAPD had an issue with the technology and integrating, but the Bureau of Justice Assistance refunded them that, 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 that money that they wasted. Um, and, and they were able to fix that problem. And so I am happy that the sheriff is now on board with body worn cameras, but this issue of funding is, in my opinion, given the, the many opportunities that there were and have been to get funding for this, is somewhat of a self-created problem. In addition to that, this idea that the sheriff answers to the county commission, he does not. He's a constitutional officer. As a matter of fact, if you look up the statute that governs the budgeting process between them, the sheriff doesn't even give them line item transparency into the budget that he requests. He gives them three categories funding, he asked for buckets in three categories. He gives them transparency into 11 subcategories. The county commission can come back to him and say, we would like to adjust the number in one of those three large buckets. But on those 11 subcategories, they can't offer any amendments whatsoever. Not only that, let's say that they make adjustments to one of those three categories that he's allowed to bring forward. And he doesn't like it, he can appeal to the administration commission. And there's a budget hearing held by the governor and the governor makes a recommendation to that commission. And we know what kind of relationship that you know, the governor likely has with not only the sheriff's association, but the sheriff. And we know how that's likely going to turn out. So the county commission can't even tell him, we're gonna give you X numbers of dollars and we want you to spend it on this unless he has wanted to, which is why they've never really broached the topic with him until, and really they still have it in a very serious way, because they knew what the answer was going to be. I'm glad that the sheriff has changed his mind on it, 
I, I look forward to he and the county commission getting together. Uh, I would be willing, we have penny sales tax dollars. We have a much smaller uh, a group of law enforcement officers here. The sheriff has 3,000 officers. We have <laughs> a fraction of a fraction of that. Um, whatever projects I have voted for, for the penny sales tax dollars, which is to be used for infrastructure or law enforcement technology, uh, I, I would I would pull my support for those projects if it meant freeing up money for body-worn cameras. So if finances are the issues, I, I am prepared to do whatever it is to, 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 to solve that problem. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I want us to have an honest conversation about how we got here on that particular issue. And again, it doesn't take a year. Get, no, I, that so I, I, I mentioned the last time around that um, when I talked with them, uh, when we talked about bringing it, I, I spoke with Mayor Wilson out in Belgrade. He and I had a conversation about going through the League of Cities and, and basically joining together to go to the county commission to ask for funding of body cameras. It's not just the cameras too, it's the server. I mean, some of the, the big money too is in the servers and how they have to do it and how they have to plug it in and how many people need to staff it and to review the, the footage. I mean, there's a lot of, it's, it's 19, they estimated to be 19 to $20 million. He, and, and you know what, can I just- how he spends his I, money though. I understand, uh, thank you. I just, um, so anyway, I spoke with him about that. And I think that we could join together as cities um, that utilize the sheriff's office service and, and lobby the county commission that this is something that, that they should be doing because they can't just do it for us. They do it for us, they have to do it for everybody. And well, they have to do it around the... Yes, Commissioner Hardy. I mean, I, we don't to go back and forth, but I, I want to. I, well, you know, I don't, I don't know that it can't be done just for us. Almost everywhere where body-worn cameras have been used, a pilot program is put out there and it's used either for an officer's in a particular shift or an officer uh, you know, group that's, that's covering a specific geographic area. And so I don't know that it can't be used just for us, particularly if it's been you know, put out there as a, as, a, as a part of a pilot program. But that said, we do have an individual contract with the sheriff. And being as we have a contract, I don't see why if we're willing to fund these things and if we can find money for it, why it can't be just us because we're the only people who are willing to pay for it. The final thing is, it's not just the county commission that we should be going to. The sheriff has a budget that's over $700 million and the county commission cannot tell him how to spend that budget. They, he, he gives them broad categories, general law enforcement, uh, you know, uh, corrections, so on and so forth. And he decides, how he spends that money. So I'm not sure that it's to the county commission that we should go because they have given him everything he has asked for. Well, everything. I think we should go beyond that and go to the state government. In we should go to the sheriff. We should, well, we should go to the sheriff, but also just we can get funding through them as well. But the thing is that you know darn well that we say that we want this, whatever Delray, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Wellington's going to want it, Belgrade's going to want it. Everybody wants it right now. I think by banding together, we have more power in, in lobbying, whoever it is that we need to lobby to get this to happen. And from, like I said, for him to be agreeing to do it, now let's have the real conversation of how we fund it. But I think to think that we're, I don't like being, we have so much synergy with leaders in our local community. I mean, Palm Beach County has great leaders and everyone likes to work together, you know? And we have synergy in the fact that there are independent cities that are utilizing the sheriff's office contract. And there is strength in that. You know, and I, and I think that we also know that the county commission and uh, and the sheriff, even by saying that he was supportive of body cameras, you know, and, and remember, too, the county had the jail system in place. And then the sheriff took over the handling of, of the uh, the county jail system as well. Their budget includes running that whole thing as well. So, you know, that wasn't something that was initially contracted with the Palm Beach County Sheriff. Those monies changed because they inherited operating that jail system. But um like I said, I, I'd be more than happy to engage. I think there are some items that we can probably start getting involved with right away, uh, like body cameras, you know, um, things of that nature, and then start putting this, this, you know, group together to start going, you know, one one after the other. But I don't want to be put in a rush to do everything all at once. Let's. I want. We have the best opportunity here in Lake Worth Beach because we have. We have such a, tap, a tapestry of people that live in this community. You know, we have people from everywhere in the world, every color, every every gender, every every you know everything. 
And we have a community that, while it's very passionate, it also has a lot of compassion. And we've been making strides in this community to come together to do things. And I think that we could be a model city for things if we can do it right and, 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 and use best practices and innovate and, you know, and listen and get our community together. I think we have the chance to do something special here in, in our community. We have just the right makeup for that. We've got just the right heart for something like that. And I, and I wanna do something meaningful. You know, I really want to do something meaningful and really it's uh, I've learned a lot, you know, and, and you, you question things when you're when you're going through it and you cry your eyes out over other things. And, you know, this is a, a tough time for this country, but we can actually make a difference. You know, we could we could lead the talks by creating new. Poignant legislation, policy and change. And we can do it the right way and from our heart. And I'm looking forward to that. I don't, I don't want us to get all out and say, you know, I don't want delay tactics. I don't want this. I want that. I want to do it right. And I want to do it in a meaningful way that's going to impact not just this community, but way beyond for a way beyond long amount of time. So it's time. You know, it's so disappointing to be going through this in 2020 for crying out loud. Um, it's time. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, think that we should be spending more of our time tonight talking about how we're going to set up the task force, not uh, on the specifics of each uh, item on the task force. Uh, I do, do want to thank you, uh, Mayor, for mentioning how we can prioritize spending. Um, I, I had uh, looked at uh, the, the uh, transportation part of our uh, budget and uh, uh, I would be very glad to put it towards uh, our own education in, in uh, uh, race relations. Uh, but um, the sheriff does have $700 million of a budget or more and uh, if he so decides to uh, have a competitive uh, process to get the most for the least, uh, I got to believe that uh, we should leave it up to him to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, we've just, it's, I hope we decide to, to uh, spend our money wisely uh, for race education. Uh, I think he can spend his money uh, because the, the body cams are, are for his his uh, benefit as well as the citizens' benefit. Um, it's a budgetary item, I, and the task force can deal with that. How are we going to set up the task force is what I am interested in, uh, and I'm hoping tonight we establish uh, that we are going to have a committee of five. We are going to have uh, possibly each committee as five members of that, which is 25 people of the community uh, plus ourselves. Um, and it, all these meetings will be open to the public and um, they will be uh, from different agencies and uh, different levels um, and different ages. Um, so uh, can, we, can we move towards uh, uh, how we're going to set up the task force. Mr. Andrews, uh, do you have anything in reference to that and your, you know, in the, all the programming and policy that you've done? As to how to create a task force to handle something like this? Um, the, the, no, no one size fits all to the approach. Um, right. Yeah, so I, I think the idea of the committee structure, uh, the Commissioner Robinson um, suggestion of thinking about a balance between electeds and community um, seem to be um, a good model uh, that's consistent. Um, and it sounds, if I'm, if I'm not hearing correctly, if I'm hearing correctly, the committee's responsible for coming back with recommendations to the, to the, to the commissioners. Is that the charge? Well, yes. And, you know, uh, some things like it's been said, I think we all agree that uh, there's different set suggestions will be uh, more timely than others. I mean, uh, 
changing the education system is is uh, going to take a little longer. Um, at, and so I don't think we should be put off by uh, a, a timeline for specifics. Uh, but this is a mechanism to listen to the community, to be involved with the community. Uh, you know, I, 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 I certainly respect listening, but if, if we're going to be uh, spending a lot of time um, talking and um, I, I want to communicate rather than just listen. Vice Mayor. Yes, Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, I agree with you. I, I, I definitely don't think that it should just be us. I think we need to be working with the county and other municipalities around us uh, that have the Sheriff's Department. One is a big problem with the Sheriff's Department. If one area does it and the others don't, um, quite, often, quite often these officers are um, moving between the cities and, and working across lines. So, you know, I think we need to be united and, and make sure that we're doing it all together. Um, and then, you know, to address uh, Commissioner Robinson's issue, yes, we should be uh, talking to the community and are we going to talk to the community and then set up different groups or are we gonna set up groups and then talk to the community? I definitely think we need to start with the community before we start throwing people on groups. And how do we put people on groups how are those people going to you know rise to the top you know we need to have some of those conversations Mr. Hardy yeah so um to move into this conversation which has a lot of different parts and I'm, I'm wondering if I could get a second here I I would like to make a motion to divide the question so there's a question of the form and composition of a task force right who is on it how do they get on it? That's one question. Okay. In addition to the question of form and composition, there's a question about, okay, what will they be responsible for producing, right? What are the areas that they're going to study and what are they supposed to come back either to the full task force or to the commission um, for, it, right? Uh, that's another question. And then there's also this question of, are there some issues like the issue of police reform? that we can study continually, but certain things can certainly be brought back within a shorter time frame, even as the commission will, will continue to work in perpetuity, right? And so that's a separate question. Um, so there's this form and composition question. Who's on it? How do they get there? I think maybe included in that is this question of, should we have different committees on it? But perhaps that's an issue for the task force itself to decide, who knows? And then there's this production issue. What are they going to study? What are they going to be responsible for producing? And then there's the, 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 the timing issue. So I'm going to make a motion to divide the question into those three topics so that we can address each and vote on each separately so that we don't allow one to affect the other and bring this whole thing down. I'm wondering if I can get a second on that. Look, can I? I'm, Can I speak? Oh, for a second. The mayor is muted. It, okay, Commissioner Robinson. Yes, um, I I don't know that we need a, uh, a. This is part of the original motion, and uh, we should be able to uh, address it without. Uh, getting off to different motions. I'm afraid that uh, then if we make a, another motion, we'll make another motion and we're, we'll be in uh, motion and uh, not get much done. Uh, I, uh, you know, the timing of it can be set up uh, and understood. We can report back on a monthly basis, on a, on, on a 60 day basis, uh, uh, in the, you know, to the, Commission as a as a whole, um, I I, uh, I I want to agree. I, I want us to agree to have five committees to and each each commissioner take a committee. Can can we get a consensus on that without a motion, Madam Mayor? On the floor, Vice Mayor, uh, Pro Tem. There's a motion on the floor, Madam Mayor. 
There is not a motion on the floor. I there said I would like to make a motion. I did not actually move. We have an original motion on the floor in a second that stands currently. Yeah. So, so, I, so Commissioner Hardy's motion was not a motion. Well, well right. he, he made it, but there was never a second because they would have to amend his first motion. I did, and not, that I did not make a motion. I did not say I move to such and such. I said I would like to do so. And I wondered whether I could get a second for such a motion. And what I'm telling, what I would like to say to Commissioner Robinson in advance of my making a motion, which may fail for lack of second, uh, is that there could very well be significant disagreement on those individual topics. And your whole item could go down because we can't come around on these topics. So I believe that your best chance to get your item is to discuss these issues individually, which creates an opportunity for compromise on the individual issues. So that's what I'll say before I make my motion. At this point, I will, I will make a motion. I move to divide the question into three topics, form and composition. How does someone get on a task force? How many people are gonna be on there? Are there gonna be different committees? That's form and composition. The second would be uh, what the task force or its various committees would be responsible for producing for this body. And the third being, are there some issues we will put on a fast track that will come back to the commission for action? I, I, I hereby move to divide the question. I uh, would, am, am interested in your, your uh, motion. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, my concern is, are there gonna be any more motions uh, I thought we could maybe do this by consensus uh, without voting on a on a motion. Um, there's um, a motion on the floor. No, th there's no second. There's no second. Well, uh, the yeah, motion is still on the floor, Melissa, the city clerk. All right. Well, if if we, if that's the way, um, uh, I certainly uh, think that that's a a, a prior a, a method of of. Uh, moving this forward um so i will second it now the question i have for you um miss city clerk Thank you. is that the original motion was made by who i hold on to melissa the original motion was made by commissioner robinson and seconded really? by commissioner <laughs> yes so so now no the question i'm asking sorry commissioner robinson i'm just trying to get somewhere um the commission, what I'm asking is, so they just made another motion. So are they changing? Don't they have to amend their original motion? It would be an amendment to the original motion. It, I'm sorry. Yes, Commissioner Harney. Uh, my understanding is that motions to divide the question are what's called incidental motions. I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I can look it up, but I don't, I don't know that the motion to divide the question amends the original motion. But I, I, you know, my understanding is that it's an incidental motion and it allows for a different level of conversation to occur. But I could be wrong about that. We might need to do some inquiry on that. I think we do. City Attorney? <laughs> um, and, How we've handled it in the past has always been to just revise the, the initial motion. Because since the two of them are the ones that are making the same, you know, they're making the motion in a second again. So I don't understand why we just don't. Right. So what you could do to make it easier, Commissioner Hardy, is to ask the maker of the original motion to go ahead and break down his motions in the way that you want it. But if I could just make a quick comment, because I've talked to Commissioner Robinson about this. Um, the problem with your the issue that I see with your motion is that you want to discuss form and composition, but a part of his um, the, the five different committees is about what will they be studying. So I think it will be difficult to decide on how many people need to be on the on the task force if you don't know exactly what they will be studying. So they're kind of tied together. I, Madam Mayor, may I? Yes, please, thank you. I think that the task force is focused on racism. Uh, structural institutional individual. And I think that covers a lot of things and that if the task force is gonna be comprehensive in discussing that topic, at least, you know, comprehensive in its application here locally, then I think it, it 
suggests itself that a range of people need to be on the task force. But I, I would like to discuss that in the in the form and composition part. Um, you know, I just noticed that his proposal has a lot of different parts to it. Yeah. And I don't think those parts should all be discussed at the same time. And I think that we need to create an opportunity for the commission to decide on each part individually, because I don't want one disagreement to sink agreements that we may have on other parts of this. Um, and this is the only way that I that I see a way to do it. Now, if he were to change his motion, let's say, and say, well, let's I, I make a motion to discuss the form and composition of a task force. There's no guarantee that he can make a second motion. Someone could beat him to the punch, right, on another one of these topics. And so he's made a motion. He started the discussion. And now I want to have a specific discussion under the protection of his original motion about those three items. I would not be comfortable discussing them separately if there were not uh, the original motion on the on the floor. Okay. Has anyone discussed at all what happens, say you want certain types of uh, professional people or whatever on a group? What if we can't get those people to participate on our board? That's something to discuss. In I the form of, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's why I want, I would like to do that. And then the other thing is what does it look like from city manager's standpoint in reference to can the city either A, afford B, staff and do it? Like the reason I, I went and reached out to the, um, to the CJC was that there's a program in place that they will come in and conduct the entire thing for us with our input as to what the things are needed. They will come in, operate, do it, you know, they'll come in and, and we can decide what parameters that we want and they'll come in and, and staff and do those things, you know, for us if staff can't, you know, we, we, do, we do have limited staff and, we, and, and time constraints. Well, it's not, a, I'm not trying to be funny, Commissioner Robinson. Well, I'm trying I, to just, uh, what? you know, there's been a lot of talk about listening and, and then, then we talk about bringing people in to that we have to listen to. I want to. I want to be. Uh, this is a community effort. Um, and, I'm, talking uh, about having the, I'm talking. I was. I, hold on a second. I just. I, I really. You guys talk a lot, and I just want to just make. I haven't I, said much. Really. I have, I have questions too. Okay. Um, what I really like. I'm saying we haven't talked about that. Like, so people don't show up. What if I don't want to be? We want police on this. What if they won't be? The reason I mentioned that one organization and probably the League of Cities as well. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the program entirely, but is because they have these policies and systems in place. They they've done this before. They have a success and a track record for doing it. And they it's not like reinventing the wheel. And they know that you know that they've done it. They're still involving members of the public. They're still involving commissioners. They're still involving professionals. You know, some cities have, you know, uh, uh, you know, offices of, of diversity, you know, and whatnot in their communities and whatever. And these are some things that we can work towards, you know, in the future, or whatever. But they have these systems in place. And I'm not asking them to do something cookie cutter, for, you know, without our input. I want us to all be a part of it, but they have a process for getting the people involved, rather us sitting here talk about form in, in composition or, the, or this and that, that, that they actually have these systems in place. Mr. Andrews, do you have a system like that in, in place that has to create uh, you know, a task force? Oh, geez. Unbelievable. I'm just asking if something already exists. Yes, yeah, so the short answer is yes, yes, there are examples of cities that have created task force um, in place to, to guide their process. Okay. Okay. Madam I Mayor, this is Keith. Uh, I know Leon has mentioned he does have to drop off shortly, so I did want to okay. kind of throw that out there. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, Leon. Okay. And we still need to deal with um, Commissioner Hardy's request wow. and motion to divide the question. It, it, you can vote if that is he wants to move forward with it. There's a there's been a motion and a second on it, so you can vote on. Um, are you, at, are you dividing just the first question? Or are you trying to get them into the three, Commissioner yeah. Harding? I'm, I'm, well, Commissioner Robinson just said, first he said no, and then he said yes. Well, he, he seconded it. It sounded like he seconded it the last time. Commissioner Robinson, the last time you, did you second it? 
because uh, you didn't bring up the possibility of a consensus on any of these without voting. Well, it's a special meeting, so we can vote. It's not a workshop, it's a special meeting. So do we have to vote on a consensus or can we Hold just- on Point of order. Point of order. Vote order. on the actual motion. Point yes. of order. Yes, Commissioner Hardy. I recall Commissioner Robinson deliberating and then seconding the motion that I made. I thought so too. Is that the, uh, our, our clerk is, okay. So there's a motion on the floor. Okay. Yes. okay. And I think <laughs> Madam Mayor, that the questions you asked are precisely the kinds of questions we would address and then vote on in this divided question format. So you're, you're saying, well, what happens if we appoint to, or you know, we go, go to get someone, they're not there. That's exactly why we need to have a discussion specific to form and composition of a, of, a, of, a, of a task force. So I think that would be a reason for voting to divide the question so that we can focus on that before moving on to other topics. So does the form and composition go to a task force or do no. we decide that and then form the, the, I'm confused as to the whole process. That's where I'm okay. getting lost. Okay, so Sorry. I'm, I, I made a motion to divide Got the it. question yeah. into three distinct conversations that we would discuss and then decide separately, right? We would, okay. We would, right? Okay. So we would decide, we, we give birth to think task forces, advisory boards, um, authorities and things like that. And so that, that would be a question for us to decide, but we could decide it one at a time so that we don't jumble all these things together. Okay. So we've got a motion on the floor and a second. Hello. Commissioner Maxwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Before we take this vote, uh, I just want to restate my position uh, which apparently is the position of, of the members of the community, that uh, they are not interested in this type of, a, uh, of an endeavor as far as the task force is concerned. And I have in my hand 70 petitions to, to uh, speak to that from members of the community. Madam Mayor, would you like me to read the names? Or would you like me to read the petition? Read the petition. I'm interested, I'm interested in the names because I've, I may have spoken to this. Point of order. Um, the question, the, 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 the motion on the floor is about whether to divide the question. Uh, the gentleman's petitions are addressing whether the question should even be considered at all. Do I have a second for a point of order? I believe that's the decision of the chair as to whether or not the gentleman's comments are germane to the, to the, to the, they, to the motion. They, everyone's comments are important. Madam Mayor. So please, Vice Mayor, pro tem, please continue. The reason I, the reason Everyone I think, would please mute yourself, please, because one person is supposed to be talking at a time. Thank you. The reason I bring that up is because I will vote no on this, okay, for the very reason that the members of the community have asked me to reiterate to you that they are not interested in a, a, a top-down approach to beginning a conversation uh, that's ultimately going to yield meaningful uh, results for the community. So I will not vote on anything to do with this task force. And I just want to preface that before the votes are taken. So it's very clear for the record as to why I'm voting no. And can you explain what type of, so what, is, what does it say in this petition? Well, let me read the petition to you. Please. Who wrote the petition? Excuse me. The killing of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis police officer has sparked a movement across our country like none other before. The issues of police use of force and the broader issues of racial inequality and injustice are now at the forefront of the American social consciousness. For the first time in generational memory, Americans of all races are coming together to recognize and address the longstanding problems of race and inequality and are developing ways to ensure the promise our constitution guarantees that all people are created equal with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As such, here in Lake Worth Beach, we believe in equality for all and are willing to work together to identify, to identify our inequality issues and offer solutions to solve them. Therefore, in order to make this a reality, the undersigned demand the mayor of Lake Worth Beach and its commissioners the following, number one, 
facilitate a process of identifying and addressing racial inequalities and injustices for our community by using an affected parties only bottom up approach of listening to our community concerns and needs versus the existing commission proposed top down task force approach emphasis added be willing to acknowledge the city's history and role in any racial inequalities and injustices. Be willing to take the appropriate actions towards solutions and resolutions of the concern. And finally, be committed to a long-term investment of time, effort, and energy that this process demands and deserves. That's the petition. Okay, city manager. Can I ask who authored the petition? City manager, let me- My hand is up. His hand has been up for a while too. Yeah. Everyone has an everyone has an opportunity to speak, and everyone deserves to be heard and not interrupted. Please, guys. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I apologize. Um, thank you for recognizing me. Mr. Andrews has to go. Um, he's been gracious with his time, and I really wanted to thank him, but he does have to leave. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I look thank forward you. to talking with you again soon. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, uh, do we know the author of this petition? The mayor is muted. Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Is it relevant? Yes. Okay, tell me why. Because I want to know the names of that uh, signatures because I may have talked to many of them okay. and gotten a different uh, perspective okay so to share with us who who you've spoken with that supports your idea I, absolutely not. this is yes the, so i'm not going to get into it i just asked and if you don't want to tell me that's that's your prerogative and okay. apparently in, in the means of transparency you don't have to but and, and uh, but in the terms of honesty i expect everybody to be honest okay, i'm going I'm to read the names are you ready Hold on one second. That's not the question he asked. He asked. Oh, you know he what? Who signed it? He asked who wrote it. Why is it that why is it that two people in this commission refuse to be to wait until they're recognized to talk and think that they can talk over everybody at every single meeting? Why is that? Why is that that I give you the respect to do it and you talk over people because they don't agree with you? Madam Mayor, or they, may or, I answer they the of, or they have a difference of opinion. Why you is it that their the opinion? Question? Is, is less important than your opinion. Would you like well, an answer to the question? Uh, yes, I would, but see, you interrupted me to get me to call on you. Okay, um, Madam Mayor, and, and I, I can't speak for Herman, although I, I feel that we share uh, some of our feelings. First of all, uh, there's certainly a lack of trust between um, the two of us and the three of you. And we also, well, I, again, I shouldn't speak for Commissioner Robinson, but I feel that when we come to this dais, whether we're meeting virtually or whether we're meeting physically, that, that this dais isn't treated by the three of you who have been here for much longer than we have, as it's something that we share. And I think that has been borne out through a lot of the things that have happened here and talking with other elected officials. I have not heard of, in recent memory, commissioners bringing forward items and having them tabled before they can even explain them, um, having the question called on them, those sorts of things are not common, uh, not being able to add items to the agenda, not being able to pull items from the consent agenda. I had a conversation with someone who all of you, all three of you respect and who you deal with on a very regular basis through the League of Cities about some of these things. And this person incidentally watches our meetings from time to time. Um, and that person was certainly uh, miffed that commissioners can't do things uh, that you know, you know that the two of us had difficulty adding, adding, adding items to the agenda, removing items from the consent agenda, and so on. So our frustration, and look, I'm not going to excuse my talking out of turn. It is, it is disrespectful. It was disrespectful today, although I think there's been a fair amount of talking out of, out of turn between at least three of us. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying you were Commissioner Amoroso, but, but you know what I'll say is we feel, or I feel, very frustrated. And I feel that the conversation is steered in a way to make it difficult for, for us to even have a fair hearing 
or airing of the things that we would like, right? And so this exchange between Commissioner Robinson and Commissioner Maxwell is a perfect example of that. Commissioner Maxwell came to this body with what is a public document, by the way. That petition is a public document. It belongs to the public, being as it's in your possession and being as it pertains to the city. Commissioner Robinson asked a straightforward question, who wrote it? Commissioner Maxwell refused to say. That in itself is, is, is just like, what kind of body is this? Is this how we work together where we bring petitions to this body, but we don't tell folks who wrote it? And then when he finally began to answer the question, he didn't answer the actual question. He answered the question that Commissioner Robinson asked in addition to that, which is who signed it, right? So just these basic things breed animosity and, 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 and make it, and, and make at least me feel that I have to be rowdy in order to be heard. What we're doing, frankly, is a lot like what protesters did a few weeks ago when they rioted, because they, they felt that that was the only way they could get the attention of people in power. Commissioner Robinson and I are not in power. And we sometimes feel that the only way we can get your attention is by breaking the rules. And I regret breaking the rules, but unfortunately, whether that was today or in prior meetings, that was the only way that I could get your attention and have what I felt was a fair hearing. I'll take responsibility for breaking the rules, but that's the answer to your question. Well, th the question that I have is that, and you know me, I like to follow the rules. I mean, I have sided on issues on both sides. I, I'm like the swing vote, you know what I mean, in, in the middle of it. And I have sided with them on issues. I've sided with you guys on issues. And I listen to you guys. And I and I do it. The, the thing to me about rules is, you know, is that it gives everybody an opportunity to have the same amount of time, to have the same amount of minutes of speaking, to have the things so there's there's equality around because rules create well, an, an equal lever of things you know what i mean and and it gives you, you the opportunity to do things when you're first of all when you get into my mother used to say something it's it's not what you said it's how you say it okay and sometimes people get up there when they have an opinion on something and someone doesn't agree with them you're you're you know, we're talking about racism, systemic racism right now, and we all need to sit down and have a conversation, and we all have to be able to feel safe. I mean, that was the one thing that he mentioned in his presentation, that what's, what goes on here stays here, doesn't, doesn't go out on media or social media or wherever, where you badmouth and, 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 and tell people that they need to be brought to justice, or they need to be reprimanded, or they need to be disciplined. I've seen the words that you use online mm -hmm. and social media and disciplined and, and whatever. And, and you speak very harshly about me and other people. And, and you make no mistakes and make no bones about it. And then you come here and want us to be fair when you can't even, you can't even follow a rule, number one, or, and then if, if we don't agree with you, or if I don't agree with you, or if somebody else doesn't agree with you, you go on social media and you bash them. Mm -hmm. So if that doesn't feel fine or fair or good, or maybe yeah. even, Maybe you incite people to death threats, or maybe you incite people to to call my clients and I, and. No, hold on one second. No, maybe, no. Come on. Just what's you know, going on. You want to have. Ever. You want to be honest. Yeah. Let's be honest. Sure, we have sure. to be able to talk, and rules are the only thing by showing respect to one another to allow everyone to talk in their own time and have that opportunity to express themselves without being talked over, without being lectured to, and without being, because they don't agree with you, you still have to show respect. And that's what I ask at every meeting and every meeting in the recent months has turned into this. And I'm very upset about that. Madam Mayor. So what happens to me in my life for well, the commission in this city, we need to be able to have and be respectful to one another. If we're gonna make real change in this world in reference to racism and a lot of other issues that we have to deal with. We have to at least respect one another and give each other the time and the opportunity to express themselves. The, the great thing about a commission is that you can have differences of opinion. Differences of opinion is good. I have learned so much from people that had an entirely different view than me on many occasions, changed my mind, changed my vote, done things like that because I had never considered something that way. And this Madam, is because so adversarial and so divisive, and, and, and I resent it. Madam Mayor, yes. uh, you, you know, first of all, you know, I want to get something out in the open. Uh, I have never, as I told you in our phone conversations about um, people personally attacking you or what have you, I have never, ever, as in not once, 
uh, uh, told someone that they should or intimated or hinted that for anything you have done on this dais, you should be uh, punished economically by by having folks, you know, boycott your, as you told me, you know, folks said that, you know, your, your, your clients were, were, were telling you that, that they got letters or emails saying that they would, you know, be boycotted or, or things like that. And, you know, as I told you over the phone, I, and as I said on my social media uh, several times, that that's not acceptable to me, that we criticize elected officials for their capacity as elected officials, and we don't go beyond that. Now, I have had harsh words um, for most people on this dais, but each and every time uh, I have criticized them harshly for the actions that they have taken uh, on this dais. And you are very right. When I lose in this building a vote or some other issue, I very often go outside this building where the real power is and, and tell my story about what happened in this meeting and I let the chips fall where they may. I don't find that to be uncivil. Uh, frankly, I don't think that I can be expected to take losses repeatedly in this building uh, as, as, as I have, as the prior, as my predecessor did, and as Herman's predecessor did, right? So, so if I'm gonna be treated as I feel unfairly in this building, like I can't add things to the agenda or I can't pull things off the consent agenda, just simple things like that. If that's gonna happen in this building, I'm gonna take the argument outside of the building where the real power is. And I don't think I can be faulted for that. But, but crucially- You can always, I have, but the point of information is that you can always bring them in. You just have to do it by the, by the notification time. No, no, oh, man, man. Man. In, in every city, there's a process for how you get things on the agenda before the meeting. And in every sitting, commissioners add things to the agenda at the meeting and things aren't so adversarial to where the majority of the commission treats the minority like they can't do things like that, or like they can't pull items off of a consent agenda and put them on new business. That's something that you see happen almost every meeting at a city to our south, and almost every meeting at a city to our north, and it's not done on the basis of who's in power and who's not in power, who has a majority, who doesn't have a majority, but that happens here routinely, and it's very, it's extremely frustrating. And I would like to say, remember, when I got elected, I got elected with the support of two of you. Um, and Madam Mayor, you were very supportive to me personally, but you were loyal to the person that you gave your word to. And I think everybody appreciates that. Um, now, uh, we, we came into this wanting to work together. But what happened over, over a period of about a year and a half was I would put an item on the agenda and before I could even explain it, it gets tabled, whether that's the height limit question or whether that's the question about uh, how we could potentially use fines from landlords to provide legal counsel to people facing eviction. I don't have any problem losing a vote on the merits after the discussion, but that kind of stuff, tabling an item that someone has, has brought as was as happened to Commissioner Robinson when he brought forward the issue about the docks and Commissioner Amoroso moved to table it. Um, that stuff shouldn't happen. And that's where this animosity comes from. Um, and so, you know, I want to move on from this issue because there's a, there's, you know, there's a motion on the floor, but I, I do think it's important to address, as you said, right, that there are these underlying issues as to how we get along and don't get along that affects the conversations that we have. And I'll take responsibility for my misbehavior up here, but, but please understand um, that it's, it's not for no reason uh, what is, that into this happened. What is taking responsibility when you do it every week? Taking well, okay, well, okay, well, okay, yes, I did it. On, right. I did it. I did on the it. other hand, Madam Mayor, I'm sorry, I did that, but I, I'm going to do it again right now. Sure. Go on the other hand, Madam Mayor, what is taking responsibility for things that that you know you three have been responsible for on this dais when it happens repeatedly as well, right? So, so you know, this is and and this what Commissioner Maxwell did to Commissioner Herman just now is a perfect example of it. He brought forward a public document, refused to tell the commissioner the origin of the public document. And, and hemmed and hawed about it and, and acted, acted like, you know, it, it, it wasn't his responsibility to accommodate the discussion that was happening. That was how we got right here. And so that, that was the messed up thing that happened in this meeting. Madam Mayor. You're, You're muted. muted, Mayor. Mayor. You've been muted for the last 20 seconds. Well, would it be different, Commissioner Hardy, if you had a petition in your hands? Say you came in with a petition. I'm I just saying that 
I'm just saying that your opinion that you just gave on all of these things is based on your feelings and your opinion on something, not on facts. Well, well, and also what I'm saying is that if you if you don't get agreed with, I agree with you a lot of times, and I'm I'm trying to run a meeting here, okay? I'm trying to run a meeting with people that have a difference of opinion. But if someone has a difference of opinion to you, then they're wrong. And that can't be. That's not what a commission is. We work together from. You can't be wrong every time. And as you said, when you said, yes, you go on social media, when you see that your presence is inciting violence against somebody. I have you, not incited violence against anyone. When you I see not, comments that say she should be disciplined, she should be. I did not say that you should be disciplined. You know, when, when, no, when people that are answering your posts say those things. You go along with it or don't say anything. When you say you refuse to act, that, that, that day in March, I refuse to act, you allow people to get irate and to call me and threaten me and all kinds of other things. And you watch it. You watch it go on your post because I know you read them and you're, and you're allowing that to happen. No, Madam Mayor, I just, you know, I can provide you evidence that tw at least twice I have made statements specifically telling the people who follow me on social media, do not bother this lady personally. Mayor, I think it's this time lady. for Hold on one second. Point of Hold order, on. Madam Mayor. Hold on one second. Nothing that we're discussing right now is on the agenda, Madam Mayor. Okay, we've got yes, a point of order and a second. My computer crashed. Oh, yeah. I had to piggyback. Okay, okay. well, you know, we, look, you know, we can discuss this perhaps in a public meeting, but, you know, I just want to be clear. I have made multiple statements on social media saying do not bother the mayor personally, that we restrict our criticism of elected officials to what they do in their elected capacity. There are 125,000 people who follow me on Instagram, 180,000 who follow me on Twitter, and about 10,000 who follow me on Facebook. I cannot chase down every yeah, single you know, comment. I've had, had my hand up. What I, what I I've had my hand up. Commissioner Robinson, go ahead. Well, uh, I'd like to move forward. Uh, and the reason I seconded this motion was because I didn't get a, a clarification of of consensus of how we could just do consensus on different items and, and move forward that way. Uh, if we have to take a vote on the, the amended motion, then uh, that's the way we'll do it. Exactly. I didn't get an answer on the consensus either from the mayor or from the attorney. Um, and my question then would be, since Commissioner Maxwell has already said that he's voting against a task force, uh, does he have to participate in any more discussion tonight? <sighs> Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Pro Tem, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me, for those of you who are listening or whatever, let me take a step back here and apologize. Uh, Herb, uh, Commissioner Robinson's request for the author of the petition, uh, quite frankly, uh, kind of, I took that, I was taken aback by that. Because frankly, I don't know really what, what the difference is as to who the author is. And that's what kind of threw me for a loop, and, and it's why I may have hesitated. So for the record, I wrote the petition. So I would ask Commissioner Robinson, does that make a difference? I mean- Certainly it does. Well, how so? You're, you're the uh, mayor of something, uh, mayor pro tem or assistant mayor or whatever. Um, and you've been in the community uh, as an elected for a lot longer than I have. And uh, when you continue to, um, uh, lead people in a direction that you want them to go, people can be easily led by established leaders. Um, and okay. uh, I, I would stake a lot of money on a lot of people on that signature that I've talked to that uh, want a task force. Uh -huh. So uh, to appease you, they may have signed it, but uh, I, I take... Um, I understand that you don't want it. Good first enough. All, let's all, let's move on. Let's move all, on because you've all, already said you're going to vote no. First vote. of all, first of all, Wait, I'm time, myself. how dare you? Mr. How Max. dare you insinuate that I pressured people to sign this petition? How arrogant can you possibly be? How dare you? And I invite you to get this list of, of folks, and I invite you to speak to each and every one of them individually, and you ask them yourself if I leaned on them. How dare you? That is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard come out of your mouth. I don't believe he said that. I, That's exactly what he said. I remember the time when you guys used to be best friends. That's right. I, I, I think we should all have 
I think we should all uh, have access to the list of names. This okay. list, this is gonna, turned into the city clerk. Public this, look, Madam, Madam Mayor, Mayor. Madam I, Mayor, I'm not going to sit here and listen to folks put words in my mouth. I'm just not going to do it. Madam Mayor. Well, who's up next, Sylvina? I still haven't gotten a, a, a response on operating under consensus rather than voting. It's, we, there's no consensus. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. Yes. There's no okay. There's no consensus here. Very clearly, if we're gonna, if 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 your item is to live, it's going to live because compromises have been made on its particulars. The only way to make compromises on its particulars is to separate the particulars from each other and to vote and to compromise and vote on them individually. Now he's repeated himself repeatedly. Okay. Thank okay. you. By the way, I'm sorry uh, so that I don't repeat myself. The gentleman who represents District 1, Commissioner Maxwell, is decrying the idea of a task force because, as he's characterized it, a task force is a top-down elected official-driven approach. This gentleman protested this top-down approach with a petition that was itself a top-down approach. He then <laughs> went on to say... Point of order. That, well, well, okay, but I, I, I just, there's, 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 you know, a lot of disingenuousness here in this conversation. I made a motion to divide the question. You made a motion to divide particular. the question. And, and it was Robert, seconded. And it was seconded. Let's go back to the, the motion on it. And also, too, I just wanted to say, Commissioner Robinson, when you, you know, everyone has an ability to put their opinion of something out there, right? So you don't like what, say, Commissioner Maxwell has to say, whatever. And you say, when you have your coffee with, Commissioner Robinson, do you express your opinion and what you'd like to see happen? Absolutely. Okay, so now do you ask people to support you in things? I don't ask them to sign a petition that uh, they've already <laughs> stated verbally uh, that they were in favor of, of the opposite. Okay, I'm just saying, we, we all are looking to, to find answers and unfortunately when people have differences of opinion, they'll seek out people that have the same opinions as they are or they'll try to turn those opinions around. I get it. That's life though, guys. That's life. That's let's life. Vote on the, let's vote on the motion then. Madam Mayor, gotta, Madam Mayor, will I have an opportunity this evening to read the names into the record? Sure. Thank uh, you. Public record. It's a public record. We don't have to go through that now. We know where the petition came from. I, we by the way, brought a petition forward to this commission. I let everybody know up front that I wrote it. That was right. the petition on, on the issue that we discussed Great. previously. Great for you. Again, you're comparing yourself and you're, 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 you guys are not speaking to each other. You're speaking at each other. You're speaking at each other and you're not listening to one another. Oh, I'd, I'd listen. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to call for a brief race, recess because I have to go to can, the ladies. vote on the motion? If you, would like, if you would like to, he wants to read the names of everyone and I'm giving him the opportunity to speak just like I give each and every one of you unlimited time to speak, even though we have rules that are against that. So I'm gonna take a quick recess if we could, please. I need to go to the ladies room. Thank you.
Vice Mayor, you want to check your sound real quick? I'm here. Awesome. I just wanted to make sure you're working. So computer's back up and running? Mm, wow, well, it's not giving me what I need. Well, it looks like the view options keeps getting in our way. We're trying to max, but there you go. We had it. Expand it. There. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. We'll get around it. Watch this. There. Okay. You. Oh, there. Now, the participants. If I go there, yeah. And then it should show up on the side. There yeah. we go. Okay. Raise hand. I've got. Okay. I'm in.
Is everyone back? Just waiting on Commissioner Maxwell and Commissioner Hardy. Okay. All right. Let's resume this special city commission meeting. Can you all hear me okay? When we left, I guess Commissioner Maxwell was going to read the names on the list that, of the petition that he had signed. Commissioner Maxwell, you have the floor. Okay. Um, okay, I can do it now or I can do it later. I, I just wanted to make sure that we read them in before the evening was out. So I'll give it my best shot. Here we go. Carrie Woodward, J. Lent Lindsay Williams, Reverend Ellie Lusant, Patrick Livingston, Rosetta Brown, Marie Pierre, Irma Montezuma, Retha Lowe, Christina Sanchez, Molina Fuentes, Curtis Williams, Elaine White, I'm going to probably butcher Charlene Pierre Luis. Ephigenia Lorenzo. Uh, the best I can make out here is the last name of Scholes. Uh, I believe it's S C H O L E S. Jean D. Ventus. Marie One. Inman Maloney. Marie Shoreline. Eulavilia FG. I'm not really sure if, the, if they put their last name first or the initials first. Rose Marie Milliant. Ebeline Dalium, D A L I E N. Dorothy Hardiman. Eric Lowe. Reloise Williams. I believe this is DJ Maloney, Donald Wells, Rosa, there's no last name, Elise, uh, excuse me, Alice, B O S B C A, I hope I didn't butcher that one, Murata Esteban, Diaz, Esteban Diaz. Narcita Jimenez, Domingo Lucas, Grady Lowe, Marlene Reyes, Maria Vindal, V I N D E L, Ed DeVoe, Donna Samal, S A M O L, May 4, Seliton, C E L I T O L O N. Carlos Bentoncourt. <clears throat> Leslie Valid, V A L L A D A R E R. I apologize for not being able to pronounce that name. Tony Cato. David Germain. Charles, I think it's Deasing, D E C U. I Y. That's not. I'm sorry. I didn't even pronounce it correctly. Cleo Tildo Rojas. Estebi Rodriguez. Juana Garcia. John H. Lee. Roderick Knowles. Maritine Pierre Luis. This one's not legible. Santiago Cepeda. This one's not legible. Yolande Therome, T-H-E-R-O-N-E. -E. I believe the first name is spelled N-I-U-G-K-A. Last name is Gonzalez. Essie Ruiz. I think this is a repeat petition here. R. Anderson, Jennifer Garengo. And who else do I have here? 
and that's all I have in, in front of me right now, Madam Mayor. So that's just a sampling, and these will be turned over to the city clerk. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we have public comment. We haven't heard from the public yet. Do we have any comment cards, Melissa? Are there yes, there are about there are about fourteen. Okay, if you would. Um, yes. So first, let me say. Melissa's muted. Can't hear you. Sorry. Did you hear? Was I completely mute muted? Yes. Okay. So first of all, I apologize if I mispronounce anybody's name. And second, I ask indulgence since I'll be setting the timer for two minutes, which would be the time for someone to speak as some of the comments are quite lengthy. Maria Torres Lopez, 18267 42nd Road North, Loxahatchee. We need a multi-pronged approach beyond the task force and we have ideas we want to share. I will be sharing my ideas supported by the community in tonight's meeting. Edwin, Edwin Contreras, 2220 Lake Worth Road. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. I'm in favor of a task force for our city However, the, car, the current outline has been discussed before. At the last meeting, it seemed everyone on the day has agreed a top-down approach would not work. It should start at the bottom with the people. It seems the two commissioners spearheading this project are either confused or aren't listening at these meetings. Ruby Bell, 1020 North L Street. South Florida is extremely diverse and I believe the city of Lake Worth Beach is a great example of that diversity. I do not believe that taxpayer funds should be spent on this issue. That is my opinion as a black woman and a taxpayer. As well, perhaps if we stop making race an issue, it will stop being an issue. Treat people well and they will treat you well. Cameron Stemple, 2779 Ravella Way. Ideally, without the need to wait for a task force, the city commission will abolish the police which is a racist institution descended from slave traders, I'm sorry, slave catchers, whose job it was and still is to police and brutalize black Americans in the South. Be wary of the inclination to seek the task force with members of professional organizations like the Urban League, who will take care to produce information and recommendations which do not disturb the comfort of public officials or the affluent white neighborhoods from which they receive their funding. Any task force on racism and police accountability should be comprised solely of victims of police violence, their friends and their families. Anything less is an exercise in empty symbolism and avoiding the realities of racism and police violence. Please include them and center them in any decisions made by the commission regarding racism and police. Thank you. Gnome Brown, 1701 North D Street, I am writing today in support of justice for impacted communities in Lake Worth. It is no longer acceptable to carry on with the assumption that those who are charged with protecting and serving are actually doing that equitably for all residents. And therefore, it is no longer acceptable to continue to allocate over half of our city's budget toward the police. There needs to be a community accountability process for police misconduct effective immediately internal investigations, i.e. police investigating their own as an excuse for accountability is beyond absurd. Trying to find the specifics of the PBSO budget has also proven to be a dead end. The sheriff won't release that information. That absolutely needs to change effective immediately for any level of transparency to happen. There are so many resources that the community would greatly benefit from if only they had adequate funding to do more. Defunding the police means moving funds to resources that protect and serve without the intimidation, threats of violence, and acts of violence that we've seen too often from the police. Money toward fair and affordable housing, healthcare, jobs, education, public transportation, et cetera, would be an investment toward a healthy and thriving community that feels protected and served. I support the creation of a task force to address issues of racism in our city and emphasize the need for this task force to be comprised of members of the community most impacted by it. This includes people of color, people from immigrant communities, people experiencing homelessness, poverty, 
and those who are otherwise marginalized in this inequitable society. People around the globe are rising up to demand change now. Some have been working for justice for a long time and others are just now waking up to it. I expect this commission to represent this diverse community. Okay. The next one is um, Kim Stokes, 1321 North L Street. I'm excited to see the city take an interest in tackling systemic racism. It is an important issue and comes in many forms. If we are going to figure out the best way to move forward, we need information about how our resources are being spent. I think the task force should make it a priority to get a line item budget from the sheriff and make that information available to the public. Only then can we decide if our resources are being spent wisely and I have a feeling they may not be. It is more expensive to punish crime than it is to prevent it. I also think the task force must include voices from our community that are most directly affected by racist policies and get input from them. I would like to see some virtual town halls set up on various topics, such as public safety, education, housing, and many more. However, I think the task force should make public safety and policing a priority so they can move forward quickly without trying to solve all the issues at once. Sue Welsh, 1331 North Palmway. Good evening, commission, mayor, and city manager. I appreciate your acknowledgement of the civil unrest, and in doing so, you must see the legitimate criticism that the laws police uphold maintain systemic racism. Please prioritize analyzing the PBSO contract and seek alternatives that increase public health safety and resilience. The system of economics and governance that we live under are unfair or inhumane, and that system exists and works precisely because the police are there to make sure it does. An individual officer can be a nice person, can follow all the rules and regulations, yet they still work to defend a legal system that is built to maintain wealth and safety for some while stripping it from others. These are bad things. There are alternative, better methods of supporting healthy communities, and this movement is overwhelmingly focused on abolition of the police state and switching to a system of community control, not reform or sorting out bad cops because it's not just bad cops, it's a bad system. Shanna Willis, 1027 South Palmway. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. We are at a very crucial time in the world to enact lasting change with respect to systemic racism. Now is your chance as our elected officials to take the correct actions. A task force, if enacted, if enacted effectively, is a positive step. Though effective implementation will involve immediate action to analyze the policies and costly budget of our PBSO contract before the August renewal, I'm sorry, that was before the August renewal. Over militarized equipment, surveillance cameras, and broken window policing are practices and costs that we, the people, do not support and should be reduced from the police budget. In turn, those funds can be invested in community programs that uplift the underserved, overly policed black and brown residents of Lake Worth. I request that you expedite the police subcommittee to act before August and divest, and divest in PBSO. I'm not sure how you plan to select members of the task force, but it will only be effective if it is made up of those most targeted. Please consider how important your actions are now in making changes locally and supporting the national call for change. A police review board is pertinent so that all members of our community can trust that public safety programs are lawful and serve everyone. The police budget should be transparent to the public since it is paid for with our tax dollars. Thank you for your efforts. Please make decisions now for change. I'm sorry, I just need a drink. Noah Wilson, 1101 North A Street. Will I support the effort to better understand the problem that is system systemic oppression, which black people and people of color experience disproportionately? We do not have months to look into something that has been afflicting communities across the country for decades. It's time to take material action now and reduce PBSO's budget and invest in our community in ways that are not causing active harm. Drew Martin, 1510 North M Street. We need a systemic and em empathetic police force that avoids violence. 
Often confrontations occur when arresting individuals, individuals for insignificant crimes, as we saw in the George Floyd, Floyd death. Also, more investment in proactive programs to avoid confrontations, as in using a social worker approach rather than a police officer approach. Officers who speak the language and understand the culture of residents who have come here from other places is important. A task force needs to be made up of a wide variety of voices so that it represents all elements of our community. Mathi Mugalan Paguth Arivalan, 1015 North D Street. Many people from right and left, especially white people, consider a world without the police. They envision a society as violent as our current one, merely without law enforcement, and they shudder. As a society, we have been so indoctr indoctrinated with the idea that we solve problems by policing and caging people that many cannot imagine anything other than prisons and the police, police as solutions to violence and harm. The cry to defund the police is not new. However, it was almost like blasphemy. Now that, now that it's mainstream, it has gained more momentum. It is a trending hashtag. The slogan echoes abolish ICE, the progressive cry. However, defunding police was an idea that had been brewing for decades in activist circles. When people power and the uprisings that have been happening in the last month or so, many cities have started taking steps, at least modest steps, to take funds of the police. It's especially relevant now because with recreation centers and libraries that have been closed due to COVID, and underprivileged people, especially people of color who are houseless, now gather outside because they have nowhere else to go. These are the people who are often targeted by the police. The funds taken off of the police department can now be directly invested into our communities for education, mental health, health care, affordable housing, housing assistance, youth development, after school pro programs, et cetera. Police should not be in charge of mental health crises. They should not oversee dealing with homelessness. They should not oversee supporting people with drug dependency and addiction. We can build other ways of responding to harms in our society. Trained community care workers could do mental health checks if someone needs help. Towns could use restorative justice models. Richard Gersio, 720 South Palmway. Madam Mayor, I write this today asking you to vote no, no on tonight's motion to create a systemic racism eradication task force. There are several reasons for this, so please forgive my brevity on each point. First, the format is wrong and the time frame is at best ambitious. 30 days to identify, recruit, vet, agree on, and vote to appoint upwards of 20 people seems to be uh, more than a bit of a stretch, and why the big rush with all this anyway? I'm hoping that the process I've just laid out will apply as it does for all advisory board members. Call it a task force, but it's really an advisory board with five sub subcommittees. So far, I do believe you need to have discussions to be sure that the city, guided by you as a commission, has a clear understanding of what direction you're giving to PBSO and staff regarding policy and procedures, but it needs to be done by you, the commission. Rather than have all the fuss and needless time consumption of first assembling the board, tasking it, and then weighing what they've learned from the experts you pointed them toward when you task them, take that input from those experts yourselves, direct to you with nothing lost in transition. That's your job. This should fit well with Commissioner Hardy's desire to take advantage of the momentum. And the momentum from what exactly? Is it the momentum to continue steady and understanding policies that are in place to see that policing issues that we've seen elsewhere don't occur here? I hope so. I'm not aware of police brutality issues here in our city. If they did exist, and if you're familiar with the social media environment in this town, I'm sure we'd have heard about it by now. That comes from leadership. Leadership develops culture, and I believe a culture of good policing has been and will continue to be developed here by our District 14 leadership. I, I believe have before, I believe we have before us. Kara Jennings, 822 North C Street. In order to address racial injustice in our city, we must put at the forefront addressing policing issues. 
The city in the past year has increased policing in neighborhoods that have majority black and brown residents. Some kind of operation sweeps program, which others view as harassment. You also use CDBG funds to create a program where code enforcement teamed up with sheriff deputies to target low income neighborhoods. Your use of law enforcement to over police neighborhoods with immigrants and black residents is racist. Your policies must change. The public here in Lake Worth and across the country are demanding that elected officials recognize the inequity in policing and the negative consequences over policing creates on communities of color. What we have is a misuse of police when what we need are mental health services, substance abuse programs, restorative justice initiatives, affordable housing and youth mentorship, you give us more policing. This commission has increased the sheriff's contract by $1.3 million over the past five years. While you pump more and more money into PBSO, you have slashed vital community programs. For example, you cut the library by 20% while simultaneously increasing funds for the sheriff's contract. A task force is no replacement for you taking action now on renegotiating the sheriff's contract and making significant budget changes. We do not support half of our operating dollars going to policing costs, the sheriff's contract, overtime costs, tag readers, et cetera. The contract renews in August and you're currently in the budget process. When will you address renegotiating the contract and making budget changes? Given the actions of this group of people, it is questionable that you are the appropriate group to, appro to appoint a racist, I'm sorry, a racial justice task force. But if you appoint a task force to look Rachel Kajewski, 1510 North D Street. Although I am supportive of a task force, it is absolutely in no way enough. A full defending of the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department is critical to the city thriving. How many black and brown people have to die to prove that police are racist and that the system is racist? This task force should also address where those funds would go, such as investing into affirmative action grants, public education, community health care, affordable housing, not at the expense of wild green spaces, De decarceration of the local jails, support for mental health services without inc incarceration or police involvement, and investment into access to free and affordable food by expanding community gar garden projects and expanding and improving wild green spaces. This money in invested into PBSO goes into arresting jaywalkers harassing and arresting houseless populations, incarcerating domestic violence survivors, arresting people for minor drug charges, and overall creating an environment of fear. Since I have moved to Lake Worth, I witnessed my black neighbors in handcuffs for literally having fun at our nearby bar. I have been shouted at or dismissed multiple times by police when inquiring about why I cannot access the street adjacent streets to my home. I've been forced to stay in my home without any information from police. I've seen them do a horrible job at further traumatizing those with mental health conditions and have witnessed them harass those who try to share food with those in need. The largest gang in America must be torn down and it can easy, be easily done here by canceling the contract with PBSO. So yes, form the commission, but make it count. So end the public comments. Okay, Vice Mayor Pro Tem. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, as a matter of uh, parliamentary procedure, am I allowed to make another subsidiary motion or two? You're able to make a subsidiary motion. Well, if it's uh, right. Point of order. The attorney. Um, I think that we have to dispose of the incidental motion. Um, which was to divide the question. If once we dispose of that question, then you can make a subsidiary motion. Okay. Then, then how did the last time around when Christy was here, Commissioner Hardy make two subsidiary motions in the last previous several meetings? This is well, not a subsidiary motion. Correct. You you can make two subsidiary motions, but he made an, well, his motion is a um, incidental motion. The motion to divide the question is incidental, okay. not subsidiary. 
So if it was a regular motion, would he, would Commissioner Maxwell be able to make a subsidiary motion if there was a regular motion on the floor in a second? Correct. There would have been. Okay. Thank yes. you for clarifying that for me. Okay. So we've got a motion on the floor in a second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Motion fails from three to two. Did you have a motion, Vice Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a motion to direct staff to bring back an agreement with the National League of Cities REAL uh, program to provide co uh, consulting services and also to look into uh, Barbara Chief's organization for facilitating training for the city commission and the staff. That would be my first motion. Point of order. Your point of order is in reference to what? There is a motion still on the floor and it's the original motion that Herman made. And the commissioner's motion uh, does not take the form of a subsidiary motion. Uh, and I'm therefore challenging its ability to be made. Every time I've made such a motion, it's a motion to amend, it's a motion to lay on the table, it's a motion to postpone, so on and so forth. Those are acceptable subsidiary motions. What, what he's doing is a substitute. The substitute. But, right, but, but, but he can't do that as long as there's a motion on the floor as, as far as I understand. Is there still a motion on the floor in a second, though? That's the question, Pam. Right. I, I think you can make a substitute motion because what he's trying to do, it sounds like, is substitute his motion for the original motion. I think that's allowed. Well, I, 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 yeah, I think so. Madam Mayor? Yes. Would it be easier for me just to withdraw the motion? Let's go ahead and, and deal with that first motion and then pick it up. Okay. Got the original motion on the floor in a second. All those well, in favor. Hold on one I second. Hold, hold on. Well, oh, wait, no, I've, I've already called it. Well, all those state so by saying aye. Aye. I'm for Herman's original motion to create a task force. And I think that this attempt to bring in all these consultants is trying to corporatize this point process and stall. Point of so order. I, I want a task force. We have the ability to do stuff. Thank we don't you need very consultants. Much point of order. Thank you, sir. All those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to direct staff to bring back an agreement with the National League of Cities wow. Real uh, Department to provide consulting services for us on how to um, work with the community to uh, begin this conversation and facilitate it uh, with respect to uh, race equity and, um, and inequalities. Also, I'd like to look into Barbara Cheese's, I, I hope I didn't, she has Jeeves C in there. I'm sorry. Chiefs program for training, if you will, uh, for uh, the city commission and staff members of the city of Lake Worth Beach. Second. I would like to make a substitutable motion. <laughs> okay. The mayor is muted. Yeah, he can do that. Sorry, go ahead. What is the motion? Okay, so Commissioner Maxwell made a motion to bring in uh, the League of Cities and a consultant who I know and like very well, uh, by the way. Uh, I think she's a wonderful person, Barbara Cheeves, um, to begin conversations about this stuff. Um, I don't think it should end there. We have lawmaking authority, and I think we should use it, and I don't think we should wait for a consultant to tell us how to use it when people have been discussing these issues about housing and policing and things of, of, uh, of uh, that nature. Um, and so I am going to uh, basically uh, ask um, for us to create uh, not a task force, but an advisory board on uh, racial equity and racism. And I'm wondering if I can get a second for that. I'll second that. All right. Is that, isn't that an entirely different motion, Pamela? It is. He's trying to substitute um, Commissioner Maxwell's uh, motion. And he has a right to do that, just like I thought um, that Commissioner Maxwell had the right to do it. Um, I, I think you should carry that to the vote, and then we'll vote on um, the main motion if it fails. If it doesn't, the main motion goes away. 
Commissioner Maxwell motion Commissioner Maxwell's motion is the main motion. So this yeah. substitute motion has to be voted on first. So we have to vote on a substitute motion first. That's yes, literally what we just did with your motion. Well, no, because I threw mine out of, out of courtesy to the commission. I withdrew it to make it clean. You did. I have, and now I have, you're doing the same thing that you thought he couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you actually earlier stated was kind of a move that you didn't like. Y'all make the rules. Y'all make the rules. I play the game. <laughs> I'm just, hey, you know, I'm, I'm literally doing what he tried to do. I'm going to carry it out. Y'all want to do this. If y'all want to kill this, I, what I think is a great idea. Um, I but I don't have to take it lying down. I really don't. And well, so I will I'd use every procedural mechanism I can. Rather than take offense to it or to talk over one another, I think it's a really good idea. Um, I have a question for you, Vice Mayor Pro Tem. When you say to bring in the League of Cities or, and if they're not available to do a program as such, I would, um, as I mentioned earlier, recommend the CJC. Would you be open to that? Absolutely, Madam Mayor. Okay, and now um, Ms. Cheeves that you mentioned earlier, is that Racial Equity Institute? I believe so, ma'am. Okay, because that's what I had. I wanted us to attend. I, that's what I was looking to come to tonight's meeting with us all attending the Racial Equity Institute number one and staff members and others as well. And um, now, would would this? I know you're talking about you know from the bottom up as opposed to the top down, and we've had those conversations tonight. Do you think that by making that by making this motion, it still allows us for still to come up with guidelines when the League of Cities comes in? with us to actually create an advisory board. Is that is that your goal or hope for this? That's what I'm, I need to ask. I don't wanna get hung up on, on verbiage, but I think it's important that we, we explain what you mean by advisory board. Um, what I'm saying is that um, I'm saying to actually like, like the CJC is, you know, they have people from law enforcement, from the justice system, from housing, from those things. I mean, they have those members as part of the CJC. And that's what I'm saying is that, are you looking to address this first? I, I, I'm trying to find your motive for this. Is it to listen to people in the community? I, I, I wanna get a good, listen to people in the community, listen to people who are directly affected by this, listen to people who have had experiences with, with this, and then using those experiences and, and instances to create a mission of a commission of some sort that could be, I mean, is that what your goal is? Well, yes, very, it's very similar to what you described, Madam Mayor. Basically, I'm looking for uh, first someone to facilitate the conversation with our community members. Right. And then as the conversation goes on, and the need arises based on the input we get from the community, then we certainly can bring in support staff in the form of wh whatever the CJC or somebody like that. That's the okay. intent. And that is the intent is to, you know, again, provide the resources to the community once they voice their, their thoughts and their, and their, and their feelings and, and address them as we go. And like I said, it's not going to be a short term conversation. The conversation will go on for a very long time, but we are giving the folks an opportunity to guide us. They're give, we're giving them an opportunity to, to speak and we are taking the opportunity to listen so we can do uh, what they want us to do in terms of f crafting the best resolutions and solutions for the for the community going forward. Okay, and now in, in this discussion now in, okay, because that's sort of why I was talking with the CJC about it too, just, just to be able to give us some context to, right. to handle an, an advisory board of some kind um, that has um, you know, a, a community group of people and experts in their fields, including from housing and things that Commissioner Robinson had mentioned, but to first start with conversations in the community from people in our community directly affected by it. Exactly. We're going to have to bring, okay. we're going to have to bring in subject we're going to have to bring in subject experts to help us address the needs and concerns of the community. Okay, Madam Mayor, he said his hand up. Commissioner Robinson, I don't have your hand up, Commissioner Hardy Golden. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, we we're sort of talking back and forth. You, first, you you want to talk to the community, then you want to have, bring in everybody else from outside the community. Uh, you know, wh which way do you want to do it? But you don't want to do anything because you just want to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> and you know, we had an opportunity tonight to do something, 
And now we're just going to talk about it some more, probably with a little bit of a cost to it that uh -huh. uh, we could have spent uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, we, we prioritize both uh, talking uh, uh, to the extent that uh, the trust from the community is, is uh, eroded to, a do, again, a do nothing group uh, to only uh, just continue to uh, kick it down the road, kick it down the road. Um, may I respond, Madam Mayor? Uh, maybe I'm not done yet because uh, you know I expect I expected leadership from the five of us, and now we're we're relying on uh, uh, I I don't know what we're relying on. It, it, actually, just spending time. Thank you, Commissioner Maxwell. Thank you. Well, with all due respect, Commissioner Robinson, I think if you had listened. Uh, to my comments with respect to this subject matter over the last two or three meetings. I, have. I, think, you, I think you would have clearly heard what my intentions were and how I wanted to help the community. And I've spoken to the community. I've met with the community. I have the community's support. And they are asking a very simple ask. It's a very, very simple ask. They would like to have the conversation. They don't want to be spoon fed concepts and ideas perhaps from experts to guide them along. I mean, you, having you, accused me, you accused me earlier this evening oh of guiding or leading. I'm sorry, Krista Robinson, if you're gonna leave the room, I guess I don't need to speak point anymore. Of, point, of, no, point of order, go ahead. Please finish Commissioner Maxwell. So yeah. if, if we'd really listened and checked for understanding, I think you would have understood that we are trying to create an environment, a space, if you will, that folks can come together and feel comfortable about having a conversation. And none of the five of us individually or collectively should have any preconception uh, of where that conversation might lead. So when we take that time to provide the space and give them the opportunity to have the conversation, we will learn from them what their, their concerns, their needs, uh, the things that have hurt them in the past, the things that hurt them today, the things they fear for the future, and the only way we're going to get that is to allow them to speak. And I, I frankly, I'm disappointed for as, as much as the five of us truly believe that this is a, a, a good thing to do, that we finally, as a nation, come together and want to have a conversation, that you guys are sparring and, and, and splitting hairs over my intentions. I, I have no hidden agenda here. I really don't. But I do happen to represent the district that has the most diverse population in the city. Unfortunately. So I beg your pardon? Point I said, order. unfortunately. Point of order, please, you, sir. You lose the precincts in your districts nearly every point election. Order. Please, point of the order. The answer is unfortunately. Point of order. See, that's disrespectful, Commissioner Hardy. It is disrespectful. It is, it is very disrespectful. You know, there's been a lot of talk about how we have to listen to people who are affected by this. There's one person on this dais who's affected by this problem of racism, and that is the one person on this dais to whom you refuse to listen and to whom you have refused to listen. The very things that this gentleman, who we brought to the League of Cities today, brought forward, issues like zoning and housing and redlining, this gentleman Point of order. asked you to address previously. Point of order. But all of a sudden, because it's now cloaked in the League of Cities, it has that patina of officiality attached to it. Now it's time for you to listen. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Now, this is interesting. We talk about Racial Equity Institute. I asked Michael Bornstein and staff over a year ago after I took the racial equity training to send staff members, senior staff members to racial equity training. Now, all of a sudden, we're talking about racial equity training. Let's be clear. We have heard rhetoric from Commissioner Maxwell. We have not heard his motive. His motives is that he is afraid to confront the sheriff on issues like body cameras. And he wants to draw this conversation out for about as long as he can. That's what this is about. He is using, he is using this petition, this process that he has devised and residents to, to palliate his fear about this conversation. Thank you, Madam Mayor, I have no fear about this conversation. And if Omari, if Mr. Hardy could slow down long enough and wait for the second motion that I mentioned earlier in the conversation, you'll hear me ask that we actually put together a resolution to lobby and petition the county commission 
to get us body cameras. So I think you're just a little bit ahead of yourself. And you it's know what? It's the sheriff. Why are you petitioning the county commission when the sheriff I is said, the one who controls his budget? Excuse me. Please you know what? We... You get a little bit ahead of yourself. And I, I take I take extreme exception to that. How dare you think for everybody on this dais? I am tired of you thinking for everybody on this dais. I am the problem tired is that I think for me. Well, then keep your thoughts strictly to what you think about yourself, not anybody else. Okay, you're not the only one that cares about what's going on in our country right now. But you certainly want to help hold yourself up as being the only one that can solve the problem. How dare you? This country has gone through 400 years of, 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 uh, of, of discrimination, racial inequality, and all the other hurtful things that have happened to the Black Americans, the African Americans for 400 years. And for anybody to come to us and su suggest that we're going to put a task force together and in 90 or 60 days or whatever the heck we're doing from the top down and somehow we're going to miraculously solve these issues how arrogant could we possibly be how arrogant can we possibly be there's a time for us to listen the time is now and quite frankly Commissioner Hardy, you don't do a lot of listening you do a lot of talking and well, i'm you know, look right, i order. believe in listening but i think you're using that as an excuse to draw out this conversation you have an opinion but you don't need to part look, you don't need to look, lecture your, me. Your, your friend of 20 years who knows you much better than i do believes that okay and 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 that's really what this is about i i i the, there is mistrust here because i do not believe that you three are serious about addressing these issues Point of, order. Of matter is, Point of order. Excuse me. You can't speak Point for me. Point of order. I, 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 I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say. I said. I think. I said. I think. think. You know what? And then. And then all of a sudden, then. Then it must be true. Must be true. It must won't be, be on social media later. Oh, no. Obviously, yeah. obviously, one believes things that they think are true. If you want to make a vacuous statement, tell someone that it's in your opinion that you believe yeah. such and such. I mean, come on. You know, let's let's just get on with it. Let let's just let's just get on with it and lose this. Okay. Let's just get on with it. This is this, this, this body has has, has become a, a a place where disgraceful things occur. You, I really resent that. I I I resent the way that this has played out. You sit there. You, you resent you things. There, I resent things. Refuse this, to. This entire move. thing is. Let's just let's just get it over with, shall we? Well, because you, you know, know we know. No, I like, I like to continue. What we talk. got in this building today. I think, and I think I'd like to talk about it because I, I don't know. Last I checked, I ran the meetings, but I really haven't done much of that in a long time because you just won't stop talking. So I think I'm just going to continue to talk and invite people to talk for the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Can you guys fill some conversation? That's fine. Yeah. I'm just glad that you decided that that you have an opinion on people and that and it's right and that that we're all this and it's unfair for that and then you don't have to follow the rules which you don't have to and you can just take over and talk about whatever you want and you're the only opinion who's right and and that's how we're going to play it from now on and if anybody else talks out or has a difference of opinion even though i've over and over again sat here to try to get both sides together on many 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 issues but then it gets into a fight. And then usually, you know who takes the brunt of it? I take it for being in the middle some here, trying to get you guys to compromise. And I think that this is a good way to compromise. That's why I reach out to the, the you know, the, oh, I'm just so frustrated because this is such a, a, an opportunity for us to come together and do something really good. Like I mentioned earlier, and now it's a big crap fest again. And I'm just really tired of it. I'm really, really tired of it. We've got, what's the motion on the floor right now? City Clerk, please read it. Where are we at? We had the first motion from Commissioner Maxwell? No. Uh, first one's from Commissioner Robinson. No, that one's already been voted on. We voted on the two already. Did right. we not? Right. Yes. yes. We voted on, we oh. voted on Commissioner Hardy's motion, and then we voted on Commissioner Robinson's motion. So okay. now we're looking at Commissioner Maxwell's motion, which was seconded, seconded by you, Vice Mayor. Yes. Right. Okay. Oh, since I never took stenography, the motion by Commissioner Maxwell seconded by Vice Mayor Amoroso to direct staff to bring back an agreement with REAL to provide consulting services to facilitate the conversation and to look into, I didn't get the name, Barbara Cheeves of the Racial Equity Institute, yes, correct. as well as the CJC. Yes. Okay, and that was seconded by the um, Vice Mayor. Vice Mayor Amoroso. 
Okay, we've got a motion on the floor and a second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay, I love you, Barbara Chief, but nay, I'm sorry. Okay. Commissioner Robinson? I'm sorry, did Commissioner Robinson vote? No. Do I have to? Yeah. I mean, we're, not, we're not doing anything but talking. I'll say uh, anything I want. Uh, just yes. Yeah, no, I. I yeah, no, I. I Doesn't so matter. Thank you. So the motion carries four to one. Okay. Thank you. You said I'm you had sorry, a. Second. Wait, I'm sorry. Did Commissioner Robinson vote for it? Yes, he did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we have to, you know, at some point, we're going to have to go up and, and make some decisions. I'm not going to be party to this guy's uh, obstruction. I mean, I, I get that it's a good idea, but his motives are, are full of it. And he's just using it to obstruct. I agree. Absolutely yeah. agree. Point of order. Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My other motion was to bring back a resolution, an item, if you will, to present to the, um, the, the Board of County Commissioners uh, as a request uh, support of body cameras and the funding thereof. And uh, if we need to bring a second one back to, um, to ask the sheriff, I'm good with that. Look, I don't. Nobody here, I think, disagrees that we need body cameras or we could use body cameras. But as it's been explained over and over and over again, there's a funding question. So if we believe the funding's in place, then let's go ahead and, and take advantage of it and, and let's, let's do it and, and let's put the issue to rest. The body camera is a very good tool and, and I support it. So. I'll second that motion. Okay. Well, I, Vice Mayor, you had your hand up. Did you want to talk or were you seconding? Uh, well, it, I missed my second because I wasn't called on somebody spoke out of turn. Um, however, I, I support body cameras. I'm very concerned in the funding. funding. Um, I, I'd like to look at, you know, reaching out to the state, reaching out to the governor, you know, all funding. Um, okay, okay, well, somebody's rolling their eyes. So um, look at all funding options. How's that? I like it. Okay, we've got a motion on the floor. Sorry. And I'm sorry. Yes, Commissioner Hardy? Um, you know, first of all, um, how about reaching out first to the sheriff who has a budget of 700 plus million all dollars. funding options? Excuse me. No, well, you don't get to interrupt all the time, and then I don't get just, to. That's fine. I'll just talk too. So the sheriff has a has a 700 million dollar plus budget. Uh, the county commission can't tell him what to do with that money. They don't even get the final say on how he spends his money. The question should be put simultaneously to both the county commission and the sheriff, but the sheriff is the decision maker in this process, okay? So not the county commission, okay? So, 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 so let's put forward, uh, you know, I'm gonna put forward an amendment, which is a subsidiary motion. I asked to amend this motion uh, to uh, send the same missive uh, to the sheriff that we will send to the county commission, uh, but with uh, one particular addition to the sheriff, which is that uh, he request from the county any and officially any additional funds that may be required for body cameras for all PBSO deputies. He hasn't requested money for body cameras from the county commission yet, to my knowledge. He's made statements to local mayors. I, 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 have, I have seen no such statement put to the board uh, of, of uh, county commissioners. So I would like the motion to be amended to ask the sheriff to request those body cameras uh, uh, and, and funding for that from the board of county commissioners because he's the person who spends this money. Semantics. Do you have a second? Second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. 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 Mr. Robinson. Okay, so we go back to oh, the motion by the vice mayor. I'm Pro sorry, did Robinson vote on that? Yes. He voted nay. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, I sorry, voted, no, you voted, I'm sorry, you voted aye, excuse me. I was thinking of the first vote, sorry. 
Um, okay, so then we go back to the original motion that was made by Commissioner Maxwell to approach the county commission and other parties that was right. seconded by Commissioner, the vice mayor That's and all right. those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Opposed? No, I'm not opposed. Hmm? I'm not opposed, but we're not asking the person who's making the decision. I'll vote aye, but the county commission doesn't so decide what the sheriff spends his money on. It's just we can start finding out where the funding source comes from, and then we can we can see what happens. Motion. We motion. motion. We're on voting already. Yeah, yeah well, I just as Commissioner Maxwell did, I'm making an additional motion. I move. We were in the in the process of voting. We had all of our yeas, and we were just waiting for nays. We've I, already got our yeas, and the vote is already in voted place. Yay! I voted yay. You voted yay, and Commissioner Robinson hadn't voted yet. He said right. he's not opposed. Huh? So the motion passes. Yes. Okay. Right. Now I move to send a letter to the sheriff requesting that he a ask the county commission. Point of order, Madam Mayor. I'm sorry. I'm making a motion. What's the reason for your point of order, Vice Mayor? We've already addressed that issue. No, it's we have not. I am making a completely failed. different motion. It failed. To, it failed. To, the other motion failed. You were asking. As a, and, excuse me. As an amendment to your original motion. And as you said, as you said, Commissioner Maxwell, you yes, would have no problem with an additional motion after this. Did you not say that? Did you not say that you would have no problem sending a, a letter to the sheriff? You're, I'm sorry? You're asking to, to move on the same thing that you, we just voted down. The, the, excuse me, but that was a subsidiary motion on an, an original motion. It was an amendment to your okay, item. Do now, a second. Well. I have a to Commissioner Hardy. Do I, if Commissioner Robinson's around. Motion fails for lack of a second. First Thank of all, you. I haven't finished making my, my motion. Ma uh, Madam Clerk, did I finish making a motion? We can't read your mind. We don't know. Okay. So my motion is I move that this body send a letter to the sheriff asking A, which means first, that the sheriff request additional funding from the county commission to fund body cameras for all 3,000 deputies in the county. And B, that the sheriff commit himself to funding body cameras out of the budget that the county commission gives him if they do not give him additional funding uh, for these body cameras. 